we are now proceeding towards our first technical session that is on plantation crops in fruit in india future perspectives for this session we have with us dr hari nivas mishra sir professor of food technology iit kharagpur will be delivering the session for plantation crops in india future perspectives he is the session chair for today's session and will be delivering the special address before starting the session i would like to introduce sir He holds doctorate degree in post harvest technology from IIT Kharagpur in 1988. He is having over 36 years of professional experience in teaching, research, and administration. Has many laurels and award to his credit. He is one of the editorial boards of several reputed journals. He has received several uh, awards and honors such as AIPA Presidential Award and many more for his outstanding contribution into the field of process food processing in the country. Thank you so much, sir, for the value. Uh, Thank you so much sir, for accepting the invitation. Now the session is over to you, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. Uh, plantation crop in India, future perspective. Okay. So, I think uh, Doctor Haber has very nicely elaborated that is, uh, plantation crops are high-value commercial crops which play a vital role in the agricultural economy and export trade of many developing and developed. country and the crops in india particularly include tea coffee cocoa coconut arcanut oil palm pamera palm and cashew that uh, if you look at the total production that arcanut in our country in year 2020 was around 1100 1108 1000 metric tons cocoa 26000 t uh, that is 179000 metric ton etc and other coconut cashew and coffee also very high, huge amount of these items are produced plantation crops so in this slide just i have tried to narrate the area production and productivity of plantation crops and these particularly they are uh, uh, concentrated mainly in the southern states of the country kerala karnataka and tamil nadu you can see that about 27% each is contributed by kerala and karnataka as far as the total plantation crop production is concerned the second is the tamil nadu with 24% andhra has 90% share in the production west bengal 2% assam gujarat maharashtra odisha all about 2% and the remaining states are around 3% <coughs> assam west bengal tripura arunachal pradesh etc are the tea producing state that is of course the south indian state also produce tea so the area under production then production and productivity if you see that from 2004 to 2019 and 20 there has been of course not much is what it would have been that in 2018 that 3147 1000 hectare was area under cultivation in 2045 but in 2018 19 it is just 4000 so not much emphasis has been made here not much increase similarly the production also if you see that in 2045 although that is 9835 And in 2018-19, the total production was 6,592,000 metric ton. Okay, so the while the area under production has not expanded much, but the uh, uh, total amount produced is obviously it is almost doubled in the year 2004 to the 2008. Although the productivity, productivity that is uh, in 2004-5 was 3.13. And 2018-19 to a 4.08, that is metric ton per hectare. So this there is need this data itself is because this is the data of the invest 2020 to to this speaks too much. That is a part of the major area which needs focus uh, our attention in this important uh, crop crop sector. Sector. Let us uh, let me give you a little bit market insight. of the plantation crops that they are potential sector for the some crops with a lot of opportunity of employment generation foreign exchange earnings and overall supporting livelihood sustenance of mankind at large first we talk about coconut 
coconut products market size was valued at around 11.5 billion in 2018 and it is estimated to reach dollar 30 31.1 billion by 2026 and therefore registering a cagr of 13.6% from 29 to 26 in 2018 the coconut oil segment accounted for more than half of the total coconut products market share the indian cashew market is projected to register a compounded annual growth rate of 4% during the forecast period of 22 to 27 india has been the top exporter in the global sold cashew trade accounting more than 15% of the global cashew export in the last 4 years the indian chocolate market reached a value of us dollar 1.9 billion in 2020 with the country currenting currently representing one of the world fastest growing market for chocolates the indian chocolate markets exhibit a cagr of 11.3% during 21 to 26 so that is a compounded growth rate is very it has to, it is expected to be very good and very high similarly if we are known worldwide for one crop that is the tea tea market is projected to witness a further growth of about cagr 4.2% in 2026 the tea industry in india is expected to attain 1.4 million tons the ready to drink segment has the potential to witness a healthy increase the industry will also be driven by the increasing innovation in packaging and flavors in the coming years the total coffee export was to the tune of us dollar 377.65 million in april 2021 to august 2021 and for august 2021 it was valued at us dollar 76.71 million for the financial year 2021 the total coffee export accounted for us dollar 719.5 million and for march 2021 it was us dollar 97.41 million the coffee segment accounts to dollar 808 million and is expected to grow annually by 8.9% cagr in 2020 to 2025 and if you see that in the coffee export value that revenue earned by the coffee in terms of us dollar okay it is annual every year it is almost increasing and by 2025 it is expected to reach 1240 million us dollar okay. so this gives that is this market insights and data gives talks about very good about indian plantation crop sector but this uh, sector is still there is a lot of potential a lot miles ahead to be go gone uh, we have to, have to go They do several things so the major challenges in this sector to my mind include like that in some cases some crops are perishable so short shelf life and deterioration of nutritional and sensorial quality like of modern harvesting practices and cold storage infrastructure and inappropriate post harvest management so these becomes more important that should be taken care of and then also that is this is a very health value crop many of these uh, uh, crops are having a good source of uh, antioxidant and other bioactive susceptible so this uh, the technical skills of uh, post harvest management and processing etc need to be developed so as that uh, add value the pro uh, uh, pro processed product and they are health value health component are retained also the toxicity of the residual agrochemicals which are used in the pest management in the field the crop etc these need to be taken care of lack of value addition quality upgradation and improper post harvest practices then this uh, even climatic hazards prevalence of diseases and pests difficulties in clearing of dense vegetable cover soil erosion due to over exploitation etc these are the some of the challenges uh, which need to be Uh, looked into in this sector the major issues the facing the plantation crop industry that is the even most of the major problem faced in almost all plantation crops crop sectors they are almost similar and the biggest challenge is the mechanization during harvesting in 
many times, even almost all crops, that is the harvesting is either manual or very difficult, that is ever intensive. So there is a lot of maybe now today we are in the era of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and these tools and, uh, are even uh, internet of things and other things that has to be generated. A smart industry, now we are in the food processing industry, 4.0. So that needs to be implemented properly in this plantation crops sector. That is the smart harvesting system and then post harvest management system are need to. Then, in fact, uh, these uh, even wherever this manual harvesting is done, this uh, they are really which required a trained manpower. This manpower should be properly trained. So many a times shortage of labor, less wages, and welfare programs for labor are some major issues. Even there is a, of course, now the government of India has taken major initiative in some of this sector, but still there are some issues which need to be resolved, particularly in the case of Kaisu and all those things, unorganized supply chain and vulnerability in the price in the coconuts, etc. Incident of pest and disease in major is major concern with many challenges. Of course, comes many opportunities also in the sector. All right, that is what are to be done. Like challenges, these challenges what are there now? Uh, these are to be taken as opportunities. That area of missed new post harvest management with the new possibilities that as far as possible. That is, we should now look up for that where it is generally farm level processing, etc. That ventures need to be developed, ventures for minimal processing, okay. Even local manufacture of primary processing machineries, that is what we should talk about, make in India. Cold chain and preservation infrastructure facilities are to be uh, developed uh, that is without any break from the farm gate to the consumer. Shortening of the distribution chain, we should work out for more B2B ventures here. Value added product need to be developed. And then, uh, and the very, very important uh, aspect is the byproduct utilization area that is extraction of bioactive functional foods, etc., can be uh, done using the byproducts of this plantation crop. So, these, there is a new application, new technologies should be used for managing these things. As far as the reducing the supply chain losses, like the, the planned food processing infrastructure in upstream, that is production, post harvest handling, storage, and efficient processing, storage, and distribution in downstream are the major strategies to uh, reduce the supply chain losses. And then new processing methods, now, that is emerging technologies of processing, that is the non thermal technologies alternate thermal technologies or advanced thermal technologies etc., which should be uh, applied for the product of processing and value addition and because these uh, technologies aim to achieve food products which are rich in health promoting components okay and with the appropriate self life also these play a crucial role in product innovation produce sophisticated and diverse food products they eliminate the local use of boilers or steam generation system, etc. Avoid the use of non-renewable energy in many times. They maintain integrity and phytochem of the phytochemicals and retain the nutritional quality. Okay, inactivate oxidative enzyme minimum. So they are now that is a lot of work is being done at the Nipton Panjaur and many other places on non-thermal uh, processing area. So these should be extended to the plantation crop processing and their value addition. The, we, there are also, of course, the people uh, have come up, with, particularly during COVID period, and there are new startup trends and emerged out. There are like sugar-free cold infusion flavored teas are there into the market, and then it's saving, it's training difficulties in tree making, so that you can see that as uh, this tea prepared tea, made tea are put into the other and just put into the hot water and once the colors and flavor are resolved, take the material. So it's training difficulties are removed, making it possible. Then even the there are a lot of work are being done in several places, including uh, Nipton Tanjore that is making sustainable packaging use of these materials of the byproducts of plantation crop sector in sustainable level packaging. Then even Portable hand powder espresso coffee maker. That is a 
again a need that if it is developed and some companies have come up forward with because the espresso hand portable espresso coffee maker it, it will make the even at the home scale and zero waste coffee capsules such as some of the area so these are the some of the emerging trends and startups in the plantation crop and area is very wide it needs to be taken into so finally i will just say that yes there is there is a need for for taking a holistic approach from in to in from farm to fork right from the harvest to post harvest and then the distribution system pre processing processing and then computer vision system has a open gmp tools artificial intelligence machine learning all these methods to be applied rfid etc in the marketing processing distribution retail until the material reaches to the consumer so that the product is obtained this is of the good quality and it's artisan crop are the major export revenue generator generation in the agricultural produce so they being important health and value the crops should be given utmost attention and proper care so finally what i will summarize with what uh, should be the way forward what should be done that utilization of the already that is information or knowledge which is generated through ongoing plant practices etc should be used to develop novel technologies application of these novel technologies for enhancement of the self life and adoption of zero waste processing strategies pilot studies modeling and up scaling of the developed processes establishment of technology or product demonstration unit uh, that is being done in this uh, scheme also prime minister say scheme and entrepreneurship development and startup promotion these are the major focus of nowadays so that and then as far as possible the knowledge dissemination and awareness creation among the farmers producers and that the proper supply chain management is to be done so with this i thank you all for your patience hearing and thank team niftam tanjore for giving me this opportunity thank you all thank you so much sir for the valuable knowledge i hope our participants got encouraged and get new ideas about the plantation crop now we are moving ahead with the next technical talk which is entrepreneurship or oriented processing technology for coconut and cocoa machineries for this session we have with us dr manikantan ma sir principal scientist icar central plantation crop research institute kasagor i would like to quickly to introduce you sir he a dead phd in food and agriculture process engineering and phd diploma in operational management and human resource management he has a specialization in post harvest technology and nano composite technology he has several patents such as a new process of oil extraction from karanji seed through mechanical expression development of sunflower kernels based confectionery products and many more he awarded as a a grade by narm for 71st of focars training he has distinguished service certificate award for outstanding contribution in the field of ap and phd and many more i welcome you sir in this and thank you for accepting our invitation the session is over to you sir very good morning to all of you most respected director dr loknathan sir and my below director dr hebbar sir dr sinija and all other organizers and my fellow speakers particularly the session chairman professor h n misra sir and uh, the my dear participants so now the topic allotted to me is entrepreneurship oriented processing uh, technologies for for coconut and cocoa as well as machineries i belong to icr ctci uh, central plantation crop research institute uh, one of the oldest and prestigious research organization under icr as our director dr hb hebbar uh, briefly about the activities of my institute so now i will quickly go through this because the time is very short so i will quickly go through the all the uh, brief achievements salient achievements uh, regarding the entrepreneurship oriented technologies happened in my institute icr ctcr uh, my dear participants you can note down my mobile number 8078761449 and my mail id manisctcr@gmail.com so you can contact me at any time any official working time working days and for your all uh, queries on this uh, technologies please next next slide see uh, as already uh, narrated by dr hebbar and dr misra sir uh, and any, anyhow i will be go, go through very quickly 
So it is called as culprits. Each and every part of that coconut is being used, and uh, uh, it contributes the GDP of rupees ten thousand crores. And with the export earning, so it's it's impeccable export earning. Uh, last year we have exported almost seven thousand five sixty eight crores. Out of which this edible based coconut products is almost three thousand two hundred thirty seven crores. And uh, it 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 sustains the livelihood of that one million uh, farmers and other stakeholders. And uh, it gives the processing and income employment opportunity for the at least two million people. And it is a multi-beneficial uh, crop like food crop, oil seed crop, fiber, medicinal, and beverage crop. So next, uh, next slide, please. And if you see the uh, nutraceutical and medicinal importance, and this is one of the main uh, main key for these uh, marketing opportunities. So it helps in uh, it helps in so many uh, medicinal benefits like uh, controlling our high blood pressure and controlling blood sugar and and helping digestion and uh, it is an immunity booster, instant energy provider. It is heart friendly. If you see the so much of uh, medicinal importance, nutritional importance. So it plays a vital role. Coconut uh, coconut plays a vital role in the international economy. And uh, very recently, there are so many uh, research articles uh, related to coronavirus disease, COVID, dental, and Alzheimer, including the clin clinical trial uh, results have been uh, have been corroborated and they established the fact that coconut helps in containing and preventing the diseases of corona and all the dental uh, or dental problems and uh, Alzheimer problems. So it is one of the uh, most scoreful product, most scoreful product for uh, for entrepreneurship ventures. It is not necessary for going for the big level. Even if you can do it on on farm or micro or small, even cottage level industries. And our CPCRI has developed so many technologies related to MSME, and it has been successfully proven. And our entrepreneurs have taken this technology and they have they, they have excelled in their area. Not only for the uh, local business, and even they have done uh, export to the very great abroad, abroad, abroad countries also. Next to your slide, please. So this is the glimpses of so many value-added product photos, uh, uh, photos of the, uh, the value-added products developed by CPCR and elsewhere. Next slide, please. Please, next slide. See, if you see the uh, uh, if you see the basic facts, basic facts, it is being cultivated by all, all, all over 93 countries, and uh, uh, Philippines is leading in the area, followed by Indonesia and India. Whereas the production is concerned, production productivity is concerned, India uh, India stays ahead of on uh, above above Indonesia and Philippines. And uh, uh, it, but we have very good variety, very good quality. But in spite of all the advantages, but we are very lagging behind at our processing share. See, our share in the processing is only six percent, whereas our neighbor country, for Sri Lanka, enjoys in sharing forty percent, and Malaysia fifty percent, and Indonesia and Philippines, they are doing excellent in product uh, product value addition diversification in at, at the at the proportion of 60 percent next slide please so if you see the consumption pattern of uh, coconut in our country so of uh, uh, 40 percent of our product goes for the culinary and religious purpose and 35 percent goes for the copra coconut oil and other other derived products 17 percent goes for the tender coconut only six percent as i mentioned earlier which goes for the value addition if you see out of six percent one percent goes for the white vco that is virgin coconut oil one percent coconut milk and four percent is dc dc powder but at present our the, the whole business in india or elsewhere is linked with the price behind of the coconut oil if the, if the if the coconut oil price is high then definitely you will get a good price for your raw material that's coconut but uh, but but as 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 the international price is always lower than our product but we have to get uh, uh, get over tied over this crisis only when we when we develop diversified value added products from the coconut and for that can be exclusively that can be used for the uh, local as well as the uh, uh, export purpose then only we will get the good price for the our coconut next next slide please as uh, as uh, as the, the the solution is 
Yeah. Now the, the, the era has gone that the increase in the productivity. Now the, the whole concentration we have to give on product diversification, value addition, and byproduct realization. So in this context, our VC, our ICR CPC right, has developed almost 23 types of value added products and it has been converted into entrepreneurship oriented technology and it has been successfully transferred to the stakeholders, different stakeholders. And it has been that our stakeholders have followed our uh, protocol and they are, uh, they are in the uh, they are in the venture that is processing and valuation venture and they could be able to do the very good business uh, in, in India as well as uh, as well as outside abroad. So uh, there are so many almost VCO, coconut chips, Mira and value added products, coconut meat recipe based products, and our ice cream frozen coconut de de delicacy, milk powder, heat mix, tender uh, coconut based products, everything we have done. So we will see quickly one by one. Next. So VCO, uh, as, as it is virgin coconut oil, it is extracted from the milk rather than the copra. So it is uh, it is one of the purest and healthiest form of the coconut oil. So it is valued for its va uh, natural vitamin D content, antioxidant, polyphenols, and chloric acids. And it, it it is having very good multiple uses as a functional cosmetic and pharmaceutical oil. And we have standardized the complete process technology in developing the machineries and processing protocols. And uh, we have two process, one is hot process, another one is fermentation process. Almost 50 entrepreneurs have taken this technology. Next, next slide, please. See, this is a, uh, this is depicting the various uses of virgin coconut oil. It can be considered as dietary oil, body oil, baby oil, massage oil, pharmaceutical product, nutraceutical product. Even it can be used as a shampoo, lotion, cream, everything. Next, please. So, so if you see the uh, total process, how to make the virgin coconut oil. So right from the harvesting, you have to remove the husk. So ICPC has developed the coconut DSK and you have to remove the shell. So we have developed the sheller and you have to remove the outer uh, skin that is testa, called testa. So we have uh, the uh, machinery for testa removing and you have to pulverize. And uh, uh, after pulverizing, you have to extract the milk. So after extraction of the milk, you have to go for the two different processes. One is hot process, another one is fermentation process. In hot process, just you are heating the milk in the specially designed virgin coconut oil cooker so, so that you will get the very good virgin coconut oil. So along with the uh, milk, you will get one more milk residue flow. So this milk residue is uh, one of the best byproduct, dietary fiber rich byproduct. It can be used for making so many value added products. Next, next slide, please. So when you see the, uh, when you compare the quality characteristics of the virgin coconut oil by hot and fermentation process along with the commercial coconut oil, so it differs only in three uh, three parameters, that is vitamin D, that is tocopherol, alpha tocopherol, second one is polyphenols, and third one is antioxidant activity. So among that, the hot process is having highest polyphenol and antioxidant activity, fermentation process are having highest vitamin D content when compared to commercially scientifically produced coconut oil. Next please, next slide please. So if you see the investment prospects on this machinery for processing, at least for, for, for starting 500 coconuts per day. So for hot process, you require 15 lakhs worth of machines, what, we are, what I have mentioned. For fermentation process, you require 12 lakhs. Just the last step, that is uh, uh, in place of VCO cooker, you have to do the, you have to go for the fermentation, simple fermentation tank. So, and uh, uh, doing all those things, we have calculated, we have estimated, uh, that is arrived, the unit production cost, the, uh, the production cost per liter of virgin coconut is 420 rupees. The uh, the market rate for the virgin coconut oil is ranges from 600 to 1200 rupees. So along with the along with the, the, the virgin coconut oil, you will get so many byproducts uh, like uh, like uh, coconut husk, uh, coconut shell, uh, and coconut uh, water, coconut milk residue virgin coconut oil cake. So if you concentrate on those aspects also, so your cost of production will come down from 420 rupees to 350 rupees, which will be more profit. And uh, you can do, uh, you can, you can give diverse value added products to be, to our stakeholders. So the next product is coconut chips. See, this is the chips, uh, osmotically dehydrated chips. It is not a fried chips. The commercially available fried chips is, is, is having its own disadvantage. It aids for the weight gain and so many 
carcinogenic related problems when you consume regularly fried chips. But that can be avoided by using osmotically dehydrated coconut chips, which is having highest dietary fiber and highest antioxidant activity. And we have uh, we have come out with the complete process technology machineries for the for the production of this coconut chips. Next slide, please. So when we see the production process, the up to test removal it is same as a virgin coconut oil. After that, we have to go for the coconut slicer. So this coconut slicer we have developed it is for the multi commodity slicer. Even it can be hold good for this tapioca, potato, banana. All the commodities can be sliced using this machine. After that, you have to undergo the blanching, osmotic uh, process, then dehydration. So after dehydration, with the selection of good uh, packaging materials, you can uh, uh, you can preserve the coconut chips at least uh, at least six months. So apart from this uh, uh, osmotic dehydrated, osmotic medium maybe sugar or salt. So we have also tried different functional and nutraceutical like uh, uh, carrot juice, uh, beetroot juice, or jaggery, or uh, neera, or any other uh, like turmeric, garlic. Like that, you can do different uh, types of osmotic medium so that you will get different functional chips you can make, and that will be uh, very 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 good for the scope, marketing scope or entrepreneurship venture. So next slide, please. So when you see the investment, so you return for 250 processing 250 nuts per day. The machinery is worth the six lakhs is required, and uh, the cost of production will be for, for making 25 grams of uh, uh, chips that will be around eight rupees fifty paise. And uh, when you uh, uh, the, the selling price is minimum one gram per one uh, one rupee per one gram, that is thousand rupees per kg. Or the packet will be from 8 rupees 50 paise to 25 rupees, so that your profit percentage will be very, very high. Again, as uh, along with the chips, you will get so many byproducts. If you use those byproducts effectively, the co your cost of production will come down from 8 rupees 50 paise to 7 rupees 50 paise. So, next slide, please. So, next one so uh, we, we have coconut milk. And now the, there is a very great demand for the coconut milk in view of its uh, vegan nature and uh, lactose intolerance population is also very high in, in global wide. So there is a very great scope for the coconut milk, but this coconut milk may not be available in every corner. So to, in order to convert in the coconut milk to coconut milk powder, normally spray drying techniques is used, but that is very high cost and very high investment. And for the small and medium or cottage level, we have derived format dried format drying technology. We have used format drying technology. For that, you need only 15 lakhs worth of machinery, extra 15 lakhs worth of machinery, so that you can you can produce 30, 30 kg per day. So after making coconut milk extraction, you have to go for the pasteurization, homogenization, and whipping and drying, normal plating and drying. So the cost of production will be come under around 650 rupees and the selling price, the commercially selling price will starts from 900, 900 to 1200 rupees per kg. Next slide please. So along the, with this coconut milk powder, we have developed a very good tasty ready to cook kheer mix using coconut sugar. See normally sugar, uh, normally kheer mix sugar is used and that is nowadays the diabetic population is also very high. So, in view of a diabetic uh, uh, population is uh, uh, helpful, we have to, we, we, have, we are using low glycemic index uh, coconut sugar in the, our uh, ready to cook hair mix formulations. So, we have come out with a very good uh, ready, ready to cook hair mix and it, it, is, uh, it has been successfully transferred to almost three or four entrepreneurs. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, apart from, uh, along with the coconut milk, you will get the coconut milk recipe. It is called the coconut milk recipe. It is having very good uh, rich dietary fiber. Almost it is, uh, the, the dietary fiber level is almost 25% uh, of uh, 46, 46% uh, of the total things. So it is, mm, uh, so far it is used as just throwing our animal feed. Now, because of its, uh, 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 very recently it has been, uh, uh, that, uh, Literatures, research articles related to lowering of the serum cholesterol and colon cancer, and it is very much helpful for the patients of coronary heart diseases. So now we have uh, concentrated on this uh, product, and we have developed so many value-added products out of this coconut milk. Next, uh, next slide, please. 
So if you see the series of uh, products, just you dry, and it is called, it is it, it, it can be sold as low fat desiccated coconut, and it is uh, very much useful uh, in bakery, confectionery, and extruded products, and uh, it, it is also used in the biscuits uh, and rust formulations. Next slide, please. And uh, making pasta, and similarly after the oil, uh, after the oil, along with the oil, you get the cake that is called the virgin coconut oil cake. Uh, this cake also can, can be used for the making muffins and uh, as well as extruders or food curry type products. Next. So, uh, with the help of uh, Coconut Development Board, we got a uh, uh, very good pilot plant for this uh, for making ready to eat extruded products uh, from the coconut milk, the combination of coconut milk residue as well as uh, uh, corn and millets and uh, rice. Next slide, please. So this is the whole extrusion process. So we are using almost 10 to 10 percent of this coconut milk residue along with the different combinations of rice, corn, and millets after mixing, extrusion, and you are doing flavor coatings and packaging, and that is called a complete extrusion process. So we have the pilot plant of this extrusion process, and uh, people are using, and some people have taken our technology also. Next. So the, the, the cost of the machinery will be around 44 lakhs and the cost of the production will be around 3 rupees and even if you sell 5 rupees, then the net profit will be 21%. Next, next slide. So very recently we have, uh, we have uh, uh, developed a Mira honey coated extruded also. That is also getting very good uh, acceptance in the market. And the next product is uh, ice cream type product. So since uh, ice cream is a dairy one, so we have named as frozen desert. That is coconut milk based frozen desert. Again, it is a non-dairy probiotic vegan product, and uh, and it, it, it the ingredients uh, contains all the uh, sugar, uh, coconut water, and coconut milk. And we also have very good pilot plant with, uh, for 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 the production of this coconut milk based frozen desert. It contains uh, uh, mixing vat, pasteurizer, homogenizer, aging, free. Uh, Freezer, quick freezer, and hardening unit. Next. So, if you see the cost of the machinery, it will be around 20 lakhs, 18.6 lakhs. And the cost of the production, it will be around 100 rupees per liter of this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this formulation. And even if you sell 150 rupees, the cost to the profit will be around 46%. So, the, our production capacity is 100 liters per mix. And we also have one product uh, that is a coconut grating. Normally, this coconut grating can be stored as a, in the frozen storage. But now we have come out with the technology uh, without the need of the frozen storage. You can uh, keep that uh, frozen uh, that, uh, gratings under ambient condition for at least five to seven days. Under fridge, uh, under refrigerator condition, at least three to four weeks you can store. So that technology we have. And that technology also has been uh, taken by uh, several hotel industries in Karnataka, in Karnataka and Kerala. Next, next one. So now we can, uh, next product is uh, coconut syrup. So this is also come out of very, very, uh, very, uh, very widely in, in, in all the southern states. So instead of, uh, instead of leaving for the coconut, uh, for tender coconut and mature coconut, so you can, uh, you can uh, extract the sap, you, you can extract the sap from the uh, inflorescent sap so inflorescence and from that sap is contains very good valid nutrients and antioxidant activities and this can fetch a very higher price very higher profit than the tender coconut and the mature coconut based venture next slide please so this is a flowing sap of uh, fresh and hygienic and non alcohol and we have next slide please so we have derived, we have, uh, so this is the traditional process. Uh, they, are, they, they are collecting from the open part and uh, it is openly collecting. So because of that, they, are, they have to add anti fermentation substance like, uh, like lime. So the, the, the color of that uh, traditional one may be pure, that uh, white, pearl white, but our process, it is having golden yellow or brown honey type color. Next, so, so for that, we have developed one uh, uh, special cocoa sap chiller uh, chiller box. Uh, it, 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 uh, so this 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 chiller box you can uh, fix directly in the, in the in the in the tree. So from every day two times the climber has to go and collect the uh, collect the collect the mira uh, 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 sap from this box. Next. 
So this is the, uh, the, the drawing of that uh, uh, cocoa buds, the inflorescence are those, and which is surrounded by ice crystals, so which maintains the temperature at around zero to three or four degree, so that the, there is there will not be any spoil the any any spoil any fermentation since it is a closed highly insulated. It is a pure hygienic and uh, non-alcoholic. Next. So if you see the yield, it, 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 uh, the, the each spadics or uh, inflorescence gives almost 1.5 to 3, 3 liters. Even if you leave uh, one spadix, it, it, it gives the sap for 30 to 45 days, that is equal to 80 to 120 liters. And if you allow for six months a complete topping, so you get almost 400 to 600 liters uh, sap, per, uh, sap per tree. And uh, the present uh, selling price is uh, almost uh, 150 rupees per, per liter. And when we see, when we analyze, the stalls and hybrids are giving more yield than the dwarf. Next. So this is the quality parameters. So this TSS is almost 16 to 18, TSS 78, light orange honey color. It is a peculiar, sweet and delicious flavor and low microbial load and low, uh, no debris and no insect and dust. Next. So these are the uh, nutritional status of us, uh, the sap. So it is having very good protein, phenolics, antioxidant activity, amino acids, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, all health promoting minerals and biochemical parameters are uh, abundantly available in this uh, cocoa tree for us inside. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the, the only challenge for this Mira, uh, that Mira or Kalparasa or Coconut Sap is, it is highly perishability. So it, it has to be stored always in the freezer condition. So just before this, uh, that is marketing or selling, so you have to take it out and you have to keep in the uh, uh, dispenser, that is special uh, cold dispenser. So that can be so. So uh, you can directly sell direct sap. So uh, next, next. So uh, we have the preservation technology uh, that is uh, very cottageable preservation technology just to buy uh, by double pasteurization technology and that technology gives the, the shelf life of at least 45 days under refrigerated conditions and very recently we have uh, collaborated with one Tirupur based global global coconut producers company so we have uh, come out with the tetra pack uh, coconut sap which gives at least to four to six months uh, uh, shelf life under under ambient conditions and it is uh, fetching very good market and they are able to uh, they are able to export to the Europe and the US also. And uh, apart from this uh, sap, uh, apart from this as uh, sap, so you can convert into sugar and uh, honey and jaggery using that uh, the same uh, existing available virgin coconut oil cooker uh, by just uh, concentrating, you can make uh, different value added products. And uh, this, uh, the uh, next slide please. So the next, uh, the, the, the advantage of this is uh, the self life is six months and it is chemical free direct uh, fresh and rich source of minerals and particularly it is having low glycemic index next so it's a, it's a diabetic friendly product so you, you there is a, a great marketing opportunities you can uh, you can sell as such in the, as a sugar or you can make in the small sauce uh, 5 gram sauce or 10 gram sauce or you can convert into chocolate you can use this into printing chocolate or dark chocolate or even you can use this uh, sugar for the local meal, traditional sweets and which can be, yeah, since it is a low glycemic index, these sweets can be served to the uh, diabetic, uh, pop, uh, diabetic populations. Next. So if you see the, uh, uh, the, the economics, uh, the selling price is uh, ranges from 125 to 150 rupees uh, and uh, even if the farmer sells is 30 rupees uh, and uh, tappers cost is 25, so you'll get uh, the profit level will be 70 rupees per liter. So on an average, uh, uh, farmers can uh, uh, can can generate income at least fifteen thousand to twenty thousand rupees per tree per year. So this is the one, and uh, the the only challenge is the handling of the labor. So the the the, 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 the whole venture of this Mira, the only challenge is handling of the labor. So the labor component, if you see, almost fifty six percent of your investment is the labor. So if you can able to manage labor. Then it, this is a, one of the uh, finest and the greatest prof profit earning venture. Next one. Like, uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Sir, we have a shortage of time. Can yeah. you wind up the session yeah, as yeah. soon as possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Within, within five minutes.
Oh, so this, uh, so this uh, so next slide, please. Next slide, next slide. So these are all the chocolates. Next, next, please. So now, tender coconut, we have the two, two very good the basic equipment, punch and cutter. This is kind of used for the tender coconut parlor. Next. So next, we have the technology for the preservation protocol for the spin mill tender coconut. So this is uh, one of the uh, most uh, profitable venture and so almost uh, six entrepreneurs have taken this, uh, this technology. Next. So next, next. So we have another one is snowball tender net, and this is also will be very much useful for this uh, uh, for the for the small level or cottage level industries. Next, next, next. Yeah. So we also have uh, different technology like carbonated beverage, squash, uh, next, uh, jelly preparation and vinegar preparation. So all these technologies which will be very much useful for the. Next. So next, I have been asked to for the cocoa. So cocoa, the one minute. Next, next, next. Next. See, in cocoa, the main main one is after harvesting pod, so you have to leave for two, three days, and then it has to be taken that uh, from the beans, you have to take it out, uh, cocoa pod cellar. So from the beans, you have to undergo the fermentations. So there are different types of fermentation, basket, box, and uh, sheep type fermentations. So there are, uh, and uh, so after the fermentation for one week, you have to go for the drying. So this drying also, uh, normally it is drying done by the, uh, 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 done by the open sun drying. So this is the indicator for the poor result that poorly fermented uh, uh, for, uh, that the bean and the good result bean. Next one. So this is the general one. So after getting the nibs, you have to paste and you have to get the butter and you have to get the conchin and temper. Conchin is just the grinding. Then finally, you have to do this. So this is the complete uh, uh, process for the making this chocolate from the fermented dried bean to the chocolate you have. Been. This is a general process. Next. Step. So what we have done in, in uh, ICRC PCRA along with KAU Coco Research Center. So we have developed next. We have developed a cocoa pot breaker and cocoa bean pulper and cocoa fermenter and cocoa bean seller. So these all, all are useful for the local small on-farm, small, medium and cottage level. And we have evaluated also. So when compared to conventional sack fermentation, our fermentation gives very good yield of 88% fermentation. When compared to that uh, other industry level, basket, heap, sack, our gives 92%. Uh, more, uh, more fermentation, less moisture, and uh, good fat, and less free fatty acids. Next. So this is a bean dryer also we have developed. This is a biofuel, and we have different, uh, all the uh, machineries we have evaluated. Next. Uh, this is the so apart from that we have also considered to bean to bar which is it is a very cottage level industry next cottage level unit so here uh, instead of coconut uh, instead of normal sugar we have used coconut sugar and uh, instead of cocoa butter we have used coconut milk powder so in that we have uh, within uh, within 2.5 lakhs investment we have formulated very pakka pilot plant cottage level pilot plant for making bean to bar dark chocolate. Next. So this is uh, after extraction of wet beans, fermentation, roasting, these things, everything we have, uh, we have uh, pro uh, that is process and protocol. We have made standard protocol. Next. So this is the complete uh, uh, list of machineries. That is roaster, winnower, uh, the grinder, and the tempering machines completely. Next. So this is a complete uh, protocol from the fermentation, roasting, winnowing, grinding, uh, tempering, molding. Zinc. So the cost will be around only 2.45 lakhs. With that, you can make 20 kg chocolates. And this is very much ideal for the cottage business. So we have agro processing complex. Next. So these are the list of missionaries uh, under ICR, CPCRI, almost 26 missionaries and 10 uh, protocols. Next. These are our brands, and uh, finally, thanks uh, thanks to uh, Niptum for giving me a very good opportunity for uh, for the and all the participants for presence here. And I am uh, very much uh, ready to uh, clarify any doubts. Kindly, you 
Uh, send me the mail or you can talk to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing such a valuable knowledge. Now we will proceed to the next technical talk, which is on marketing and branding for food business. For this session, we have with us Suresh, Dr. Suresh Paul Anthony, Associate Professor, Marketing, I am Trichy. I would like quickly to introduce her to you. He is the fellow of the Indian Institute of Management, uh, Lucknow. He has 14 years of hands-on customer interface experience gathered in the automotive, financial services, direct selling and re music retailing industry and across business and consumer markets. Following a mid-career shift to academics in 1999, his area of research and our marketing demographics and consumer vulnerability. He has headed various activities like executive education and consulting, technical education, quality improvement programs, acceleration, and program review, branding and campus relocation. I welcome you, sir, and thank you for accepting for our invitation. The session is over to you, sir. Thank okay, you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, all of you have a mobile. I just want you to quickly uh, uh, go and into this website and answer these questions given here. What do we know about marketing? OK. If you want to add on something more, you're free to add on. Uh, what I see here, someone has written uh, four Ps. Uh, let's uh, discuss what it means. Is a process of exploring, creating, delivering value. Oh my God. To meet the needs of target market in terms of good services, including selection of a target audience. That looks like a very scholarly answer. Marketing is a process of exploring, creating, delivering value. Okay. Process of making a product to commercial use means execute, advertise. Promote to sell, uh, activity, set of institutions. Oh, oh that's a classic uh, definition from the books. Uh, platform for selling and uh, buying, uh, publishing, what are new products, get it, pro get profitable ones. Various ways to create awareness. It's a main process which includes in GDP, involves in the GDP of the country. All right. So we've got a hang of several uh, answers. Okay. So that's fine. Uh, that's fine. So let me stop here. Let me stop here. So uh, marketing, some of you have an idea. Some others feel that it's about, uh, it's just about buying and selling. And let me make it clear, let it make, make it very clear that marketing is not just about selling. Okay. Marketing is not just about selling. It is about uh, the first task that the marketers have. I'm going to share a set of slides with you now. So now marketing, next, yeah. So some of you have mentioned four Ps. Now four Ps means product, price, place, and promotion. Now product means what is the problem that your product is solving? There is a customer problem. If there is no customer problem, right, your product cannot solve it. So what is the problem that your product is going to solve? So that is what we mean by product. The equivalent of product is a customer solution. Is your product solving a real customer problem? That's the first question. The second is uh, product and uh, price. Price is from your point of view. What we are interested to know is how much does it cost to the customer? Okay, so price is the marketer's perspective. Customer's perspective is what is the total cost of ownership of buying of consuming, of disposing your product. Okay, so that is the pre, uh, second P, which is price. Now, place refers to customer convenience. What we are referring here from the marketer's perspective is distribution. But distribution is only our story. The customer is only interested to know how convenient is it that you make it easy for them to buy, which means that if I dis desire to have a pickle, right and a pickle of uh, my whatever preference i have it should be available at the nearest store i cannot travel 25 kilometers just to get a pickle of my choice or any other food product of my choice a particular organic uh, um, what is that nallanai uh, or a coconut oil right i cannot travel 30 kilometers just to get that so it should you should make it convenient you should make it convenient for your customers to buy your product. So that's what it means, the place. And the, la the last P, which is promotion, is again from my perspective. 
what we are actually doing is communicating our message to the customers. All right. So let's be very clear that these are the four P's from my perspective, from the customer's pers perspective. Is my product solving a customer problem? Am I communicating? Uh, have, I, have I considered the cost of the customer? Am I making it convenient for the customer to pick up my product? And uh, am I uh, am I making it easy? Am I am I making my communication very clear to him about what my product can you know solve his problems? Okay. But before all of this, before the four P's, what is very important for us is to figure out which segment we are going to operate in. There are many customer segments available in the world today, right? There are some who want organic oil, let us say, a little expensive, right? There are others who are okay with those filtered uh, coconut oil or gingerly oil, right? So there are different segments based on the preferences of customers. So the first principle in marketing, let's all understand, is that every customer differs from another. If you take our own families, you will figure out that not all of us have the same preferences, even in our own family. We have been brought up in a similar way. Uh, we have shared a lot of commonalities with, with your siblings, but then you will figure out that you are very different from the other. Your preferences, the way you respond to marketing stimuli are very different. So the first principle in marketing is that customers differ from one another, full stop. There is absolutely uh, no confusion about it. The second uh, fundamental principle is that customers' needs evolve over, over time. Today, he is happy with your product. You bet that he may not be happy tomorrow, day after. Why? Because we as an individual change over a period of time. Now, look at yourself. While you were young, how did you respond to marketing? How did you respond to marketing st stimuli? As you grow older, as your income levels increase, as the family size increases and then later on decreases when the children you know leave your homes you would figure that the way we respond to marketing stimuli keeps changing over a time so the second principle fundamental principle please remember is that the same customer who has been with you over a period of time his needs will keep changing over a period of time full stop the third principle is that when all of this is happening your competitors are not going to keep quiet they are going to react. They are not just going to let you win the game. Okay, so please remember that whatever you do cannot be seen in isolation. You will have all your competitors waiting to pounce, uh, pounce at your neck. The third principle. The fourth principle, the last principle, is that your resources are very constrained. We don't have unlimited resources. We want to do several things as an organization, as a food business. But there is a limit on what we can do because your resources are limited. You have your budgets, you have funding issues. You do not have a distributor in place. You do not have enough people to go and market your product. So your resources are all the time limited. So please understand that these four principles have to be accounted for. Now, therefore, I need to decide there are several segments available today, but which one am I going to focus on? Okay, so that is the targeting. And the last part is your positioning where, uh, please don't move the slides for now. Please, please don't move the slides for now. And, and, the, and therefore, I need to decide what kind of message I'm going to communicate to them. We call that positioning. And after that, you decide the four Ps. There are several orientations in marketing. Some of you would have started with the production orientation, which means that I make more and more quantity at lesser price. Okay, so the focus is on quantity and on price, right? There are others who, who have moved on to a product orientation where they believe that I make a very great product, the entire world will beat a path to my door. Okay, so that's the second orientation that some of us have in marketing. The third is, unless I keep selling, you know, selling means making offers, uh, almost literally persuading customers to buy more of your product, selling rather than them coming and asking for it. Okay. But the last one is the most important where we say there's a marketing orientation. So in a marketing orientation, the starting point is always customer needs. Okay. So we work backwards. You first find out what the customer needs are, right? And then you try to meet those needs using your own organizational resources and capabilities. That's very important, isn't it? How can I meet those needs? By using whatever facility I have, whatever strengths I have, I play according to that, okay? Now, remember, we do all of this for two purposes. There are two purposes why we are doing. 
one is to satisfy our customers the second is to satisfy our own corporate objectives it is not enough that we satisfy customers satisfies our uh, customers are very happy but then if you don't make money if you don't make return on your investment if you don't make return on your capital employed okay how will you grow how can you invest further in new technology so please always remember it is fine to make your customers feel happy but that alone is not enough you also need to ensure that your financial you know health is taken care of so this is in in sum you know what we refer to marketing if you have any questions you can quickly ask me now i'll take questions now i have only 20 minutes so if you have any questions on marketing let's settle it right now what about online marketing the principles are the same whatever we have told you is applicable whether it is online or offline the principles are always the same i think some of you would have started with a product orientation which means that you find out there is a gap in the market for let us say a pickle okay or uh, you know like the earlier presentation he was talking about uh, neer or 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 a or a dessert right you figure out that there is a uh, uh, there is a gap in the market for a frozen dessert okay based on uh, based on coconut right so and and you make the best uh, frozen dessert in the market okay and then you find that there are a bunch of customers who seem to love it so now what you'll have to do how do you bring in that marketing orientation is you analyze your own customer base you analyze your own customer base you will find that there are clusters of some customers with some similar you know requirements who would love to become your customers so using them as a starting point you will want to expand and get more and more of them so whether it is online or offline these principles do not change in online what do you do why online because you find out that there is one group of customers who are more comfortable with online there is another group of customers who are not comfortable with online let's say somebody who is very elderly i do find some of them are not very comfortable with even receiving messages on their smartphones but if you see the younger crowd okay so that is where it is important to understand who is your target customer so if your target customer is somebody who uses mobile who is interested to listen to uh, or to receive online messages then you need to do online marketing but if your product is of uh, the nature of your product is such that Uh, your target group doesn't access online channels then what other choice do you have you have no choice other than to do uh, face to face maybe uh, advertisements maybe putting up a stall in a uh, in a in a village market okay that's the only way that you can go about doing it okay how to make farmer farmer's job is not to think about marketing that's your job to think about marketing farmer's job a farmer's uh, what is on farmer's mind is that there is a problem to be solved hello am i making myself clear yes sir uh, not sir, just sir. The, not not just the farmer any customer okay what he constantly keeps thinking is how do i solve a problem that i have it could be thirst it could be hunger it could be desire for social approval it could be a desire to be accepted by a large group of people are you with me i want to stay connected right how do my products solve this problem or somebody who wants to be healthy why healthy because he wants to live a long life so there is a fundamental need here we need to understand right so marketing is my job that's not the job of the customer customer's job is that he has a problem and he is looking for ways to solve that problem now if your product can solve that problem the the best in the market well he is going to buy you tomorrow if he is going to find some of some other product which can solve his problems much better than what you have right then he is going to uh, you know just shift over so the other day i was discussing with a bunch of my students about what is this product ax really solving you know this ax this is deodorant is it solving a problem is there a problem that this product is solving anyone quickly yeah smell and bad odor is it smell or only bad odor so i had this student who gave me a brilliant answer he said it is solving somebody's problem of loneliness see bad odor and smell is a symptom of an underlying problem 
okay the problem you know he has smell uh, the smell is uh, you know bad people are not able to tolerate it so they keep away from him okay so the problem that acts is solving is not just about bad odor or smell it is about that feeling of loneliness it is that feeling that he is not being accepted by a group of people whom he considers you know as very important in in his life so do you understand what i am saying that your product has to solve a real customer problem if it is not okay there are two things that can happen either your product is not solving a problem or it could be solving a problem but you have not communicated how it is solving the problem are you with me there are only two things that can go wrong either your product is not uh, solving a customer need or even if it is solving you have not found out how to communicate that message to the customers <laughs> uh yeah you have to be patient with your children you have to be patient with your spouse we we'll have to be patient with my boss <laughs> the boss has to be patient with the um with the uh, with the employees yeah patience is required patience i think the question uh, the underlying question is planning okay so if you do not plan if you fail to plan okay what will happen is you plan to fail so patience is about i think the underlying issue is how do we plan for this you know because it's not going to happen overnight i think that's the crux of that uh, comment about patience that you will not be able to get your markets you know crack it succeed overnight it takes some time and therefore you need to have a plan i hope i've answered that question how do we find gap the only way to find the gap is to ask the customer go and do research okay go into the market you can also observe for instance uh, you can spend some time in a customer's home can you tell me which kind of product is it and then i'll be able to answer next 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 yeah now how do we grow so how do we grow as a business because that's our major problem right how do we grow so there are uh, you know very generic ways in which you grow first you look at what your existing products are what markets am i currently operating that is the first step market penetration so in market penetration how do i grow using this technique so you need to focus only on two things one is how do i increase the usage rate if we are consuming only 2 millet biscuits a day how can i make them consume maybe 5 millet biscuits a day okay so that is the usage rate my existing customers i am already consuming millet biscuits right if i have to consume more my uh, top line my revenue is going to go up my profits is going to go up so that's step one the next uh, uh, you know method by which you can work on market penetration is to find new uses so millet biscuits today are being consumed only let's say by diabetics but if i can make it more uh, you know more nutritious maybe uh, it's good for people who are also suffering from anemia okay iron deficiency you all right so then uh, we call that finding new uses for the same product okay so that is step 1 now after having exhausted all that the second one is to look for new users so market development is about finding new users for my current products now when i've exhausted all that opportunity i can move on to the next step which is product development find new products uh, starting with my existing customers and then Uh, the last one is diversification so these are generic methods by which you can grow your business the next slide please and that's the last slide next slide so now what do brands stand for now brands please remember because the topic given is marketing and branding now branding there are three components to branding the first component is the covenant so covenant here uh, is a, is a word that we find usually in legal documents which is an agreement so what we are conveying here is your brand should have a very clear promise what is the promise that your brand is making to your chosen customers so that is the first part covenant stands for the promise and we are using the word covenant because we want to give it a little more sanctity than just a promise okay a legally enforceable uh, uh, agreement is called a covenant but obviously a marketer and his customers we do not have a legally enforceable document All, uh, do you get what i'm saying so here when i use the word covenant i'm saying a promise that is like made by god you cannot violate that promise number one the second aspect is quiddity how do i 
uh, you know, deliver on the promise? That is the second question that I'll have to ask. How do I deliver on the promise? Do you have the evidence? Do you have the capability? That is the quiddity part. You know, the one here at the bottom, the quiddity. How do I convince my customers that I am capable of meeting the covenant? So it has to come right from your product. Your product should be capable of delivering the promise. The third aspect is the representation, which is the, you know, typical layman view of marketing. You know, branding is all about advertising, not just about advertising, but about communicating the covenant, the promise that your brand stands for and how you will be able to deliver on that promise, which is the quiddity part. So this is where I stop my, uh, you know, this short uh, session on marketing and branding. And if you have any questions, I can take them now. See, uh, wholesale, when you do wholesale, what happens is that, uh, I get your question. When you do wholesale, please remember that the margins are lower. Okay. That you are you're selling it to distributors who will sell it to retailers and, and then finally to consumers. You have absolutely no control on what's happening here. So if you're selling only to wholesalers, remember that your brand will never come out. You will become like a commodity. But then why do you do wholesaling? Is because you are able to sell a huge quantity. Are you with me? So there are these trade-offs that you're making. When you're doing wholesaling, you do not have an opportunity to establish your brand. I hope I'm making myself clear. Yes, if sir. you are doing wholesaling without a brand name, I think that is what you mean. I think that uh, that's my guess. Okay, when you're doing wholesaling without a brand name, Okay, what happens is that your brand becomes insignificant. The wholesaler decides, uh, you know, where to sell, whom to sell and so on. And your end customer doesn't know about you. So wholesaling, wholesaling is only. Okay, his question is, is it good to do production marketing by a single person? Or is it best to sell it as a wholesale product concentrating? Yeah, I think I have answered this question. I got it right. Uh, yeah. In a wholesale, wholesale is where you, uh, you know, because you're interested in just selling it off huge quantities. As I said, be very careful when you do that. Does your brand identity remain? Are you with me? Are you selling it just like a pickle or are you selling a Rajkumar pickle, Rajkumar branded pickle? If you are doing a Rajkumar branded pickle, then taking the wholesaler route is fine. <clears throat> you know what I mean? But please remember that your margins will be lower. If you are going to market it yourself, obviously the margins are higher, but the risks are also higher. Hello, remember that risk and reward are correlated. Higher the risk, higher the reward. Lower the risk, lower the reward. Okay. I hope I've answered your question, Rajkumar. Yes, yes. Uh, sir, one more question is that in the startup company, how market plays in established organization? Sorry? In the startup company, how market yeah. plays in established organization? Uh, in a startup company, how does? How market plays in established organization? In any, in any company, marketing plays a very important role. Whether it's an established brand like I am 3G, we still have to market. We'll have to ensure that there are enough uh, students coming and getting, seeking admission. We have to get enough, uh, you know, uh, organizations coming and picking up our students for placement. So marketing is an inherent job of any company, whether it is a startup or whether it is an established company. I mean, if you look at Coca-Cola, are they still advertising? Aren't they still advertising? Hindustan Unilever, Lint uh, Synthol Soap, Little Soap, they are still being advertised. They are still being communicated. Okay. So marketing is something that you don't do. Uh, when you are, uh, you know, an established firm and you do it only when you are a startup. Marketing has to be done all the time, every day, 24 by 7, 365 days in a year. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think you answered very well all the questions. Yeah, uh, I have shared my email ID here. Okay. And here is my uh, phone number in case you want some more help. You are welcome to WhatsApp me. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing all such right. valuable knowledge. And I hope participants got all the answers. Now we will proceed to the next technical talk, which is on advance in Jaggery processing and value addition. For this session, we have with us Dr. Ravendra Nayak, which is a who is a principal scientist in ICRCIEE uh, -E -E, Combito, 
I would like quickly to introduce her to you. His his agriculture uh, research services discipline is agricultural structure and process engineering with about 25 years of experience. He was involved in more than 45 research products and de projects and developed about 50 pieces of equipment and processes in various capacities, out of which of many of them have been commercialized. Two patents have been awarded for his work and seven technologies at various stage, uh, stages of patenting. He is also involved as an expert member in various committees of so UPSC, PMFME, DSC, and many more. I welcome you, sir, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Invitation. Uh, the session is over here, sir. Uh, the topic that is assigned to me is regarding the the jaggery processing and and bit of value addition. So, so I am Ravindra Nayak. I am I am working at at Coimbatore as informed by the. Um, informed by the uh, speaker then okay i am from icr central institute of agriculture engineering which is having head office at madhya pradesh bhopal which is a premier institute in agriculture mechanization uh, if somebody is interested you can please note down my uh, note on our website and and this is an institution which is basically working on agriculture equipment and also mechanization in in various sector so this topic that is assigned to me is is jaggery so uh, so then all of you know about jaggery and then and then if you see india india is the largest producer and consumer of jaggery and if you see the various forms of of uh, of uh, of converting the jaggery so it can be into into the solid jaggery liquid jaggery and granular jaggery so what these are the basic uh, shapes into which the jaggery is being is being uh, converted and if you see the utilization pattern it is given here uh, so uh, so if you see uh, uh, in the last decade or so the utilization pattern of of jaggery and kandasara is as has remained same and there is a scope of of increasing uh, increasing this pattern then as reported it is having a lot of medicinal and nutritional importance uh, if you if you see if you see in a lot of Ayurvedic medicine and, and other medicine, it has been an, an integral part of formulation. I will not go into the details of it. So then if you see, how do we differentiate these three components of, of, uh, of, this, of the jaggery? If you see solid jaggery, liquid jaggery, and granular jaggery, these are the three basic components. And then if you see the differentiation, it is basically in terms of, uh, how much is the sucrose or or liquid content or water content? How much is it? So what uh, these are the things that basically differentiate the three forms of of jaggery. So if you see here, a uh, production of jaggery has always been in a traditional way. So if we, I am I'm I'm sure some of you know about how the jaggery is being produced. If, if you see a small clipping is, is being operated here, so you can see a basically, uh, you know, basically the crushing operation takes place and then afterwards, it, uh, there is a standard, uh, uh, there's a standard temperature and also the bricks, how much, how much it has to be maintained to get the end product. And then afterwards, uh, then after the design of the, of the component or the or the housing should be done so that we get an efficient output. So what this is how in general the uh, the jaggery uh, is being is, is being done. It is an it is an a, a energy intensive process. So what there's a lot of scope to make it energy efficient and and there's a lot of exercise exercise that is going on by various organizations. To convert it into the energy energy efficient uh, techniques. So so this is how the jaggery is being made. And then the second product, how the jaggery is being converted, is in the form of granular. Okay, this is also uh, this is also an excellent uh, excellent technique. If you are you know if you know if you're able to convert the solid jaggery into the into the granular jaggery. Here the challenge is. Uh, challenges exact temperature is to be maintained and and also at the at the end of the process instead of solidifying we need to 
adopt the technique 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 so that uh, the obtained products is in the form of, of of granules and and for that we need to have an efficient equipment i have been always telling that uh, along with the development of, of the product equipment is an important part if you especially if you want to take up as an entrepreneur we need to have an have an efficient equipment so that uh, so that the cost economics work out always the equipment part need to be given a lot of importance if if you are an entrepreneur this is generally a, a flow chart which is depicting the the whole process of converting the sugarcane juice into the uh, into the granule into the granule so we have got a step of of getting the clarified juice and then afterwards after getting the clarified juice a, a, a series of process uh, to convert it into the granule similarly there is the flow chart which is given here to convert into cubes so there is an option of converting it into granules or or cubes and and it depends upon the entrepreneur how he wants to uh, con convert so you can see here these are the different a step that is being followed harvesting extraction then after uh, seeing the ph and bricks of the juice is an important parameter if you want to convert it into the it is solid jaggery or liquid jaggery or granular jaggery so so you can see here uh, the uh, the the ultimate if you see the end product it all it it all depends upon the size of the uh, Uh, size of the granule a uh, granule so we can see uh, the different categories and then after that the efficient packing and another thing is required the section of packing and and standardization will be taken by the other speaker in the afternoon so then in in case of granular uh, jaggery uh, the main step is to is to crush the Is to crush the end product and also to scrap it. So there is equipment that is commercially available so that the crushing and the scrapping can be done to get the efficient uh, jaggery, you no know, jaggery powder. And then the next component that is catching up market of late that is called as a liquid jaggery. So if you see a lot of talk, a lot of importance is being given to this component which is called as liquid jaggery because it is easy to handle. and also it is uh, it is having a lot of uh, it is having a lot of health benefit just like uh, just like the jaggery the, the liquid jaggery is also having a lot of health benefit and and nowadays there is a concept which is called as organic uh, uh, organic liquid jaggery production and there are some institutions which are develop the technology to get the organic jaggery production so uh, so this, as i told you earlier this uh, this is how the differentiation is being done between jaggery liquid jaggery and then sugar basically in terms of 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 sucrose content and also and and also other parameters so what uh, a liquid jaggery is uh, is a good venture if an entrepreneur wants to do uh, uh, do the uh, do the commercial production and and also and and also to go to the next step of of production as 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 informed earlier the selection of the right kind of of input is a is a prerequisite to get an efficient out, output product either in terms of jaggery liquid jaggery or granular jaggery so we should have uh, have the uh, have the bricks of 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 about more than 21% and also the sucrose about 19% and and then the other parameters have be, have been mentioned so the, Uh, so the takeaway point is we should have an an good input product because there are some varieties that are ex exclusively grown or breeded for the jaggery production and this data is available at icr sugarcane breeding institute coimbatore if somebody is interested you can now you can meet the agri business incubation which is available in that particular institute so then in the in the case of the process of liquid jaggery making so you can see this crushing filtration then after settling and then after we have got uh, this clarification and then you can see the boiling has to be has to be done the gentle boiling has uh, has to be done so what there is a standard protocol to convert the sugarcane juice into liquid jaggery and then i uh, i encourage 
I encourage the entrepreneurs that if you are interested, you can look into this particular option. Option. So what under our ICR system and also other SAU system, a lot of uh, a lot of pilot plant have been uh, have been have been developed and and under the scheme of PM of PMFME also a lot of support has been given for establishing the the value chain for Jagri. So there is still a scope for the entrepreneur to approach approach um, approach the organization to set up this particular uh, this particular setup and and then and then the important important point is we need to select the right type of of clarifications. The clarifications it is basically required to get the uh, to get a good color product and also to remove the scum um, the scum out of the out of the juice again again if you see clarif uh, if you see the clarifying agent again it is uh, it is either chemical based or we have got uh, this organic based for vegetable clarifications uh, so if uh, so you can see a lot of entrepreneurs are using this okra based clarif uh, clarifications as an as an as an end source to get the liquid uh, uh, liquid uh, liquid jaggery so then as uh, as I informed earlier, we need to we need to remove the outside rind and and also the leaves before we take into the um, into the production process. And then the selection of right kind of equipment because mechanization is important if you want to go for the uh, this this economic production. And these are the equipment which is being shown uh, so that the outside uh, outside leaves of of the sugar cane is being removed, and and also there is a set of equipment uh, so that the outside outside skin of the sugar cane uh, uh, is being removed. This is called as as the ring removing equipment. And there are a couple of uh, institution and, and industries who are making this kind of of ring removing equipment. So you can see that this particular equipment is there for removing the ring, and 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 also off late. Uh, of late, there is one more technique uh, so that before the juice extraction, the whole the whole de-rind sugar cane is uh, is put into the branching activity, and and after blanching, it goes to the juice extraction, and then subsequently we can go for the value added product. And and if you see in crushing also, we have got a a lot of choices of of the. Of the efficient crushing equipment, uh, if you see any any equipment that, that we are selecting, it should uh, it should be used at least at least for sixty to seventy percent of its uh, of its capacity. So so please remember, selecting the right kind of equipment is very important. Select the equipment so that you are putting at least sixty to seventy percent of it of of it into use, and then uh, and then the filtration is. Is another parameter which is really important because the input juice which is going either into the jaggery production or 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 any of the value production it sh it should not have any any scum or a scum or other material. So you can see there is uh, the small filtration unit and also the large filtration unit based upon our requirement we can choose the different filtration unit and then if you see. Uh, the important step is also for you know, design of boilers and furnace, and and there are a, a lot of equipments which can be used either on a large scale or also on a small scale. So so what uh, I'm I'm just showing I'm showing the different options that can be used if you're going for the, the value addition from the sugarcane juice. Uh, you please visit the website. Of Shokan Breeding Institute, and there's a detailed protocol of converting of 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 converting into the liquid jaggery, especially the organic liquid jaggery protocol is is there. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are who have uh, who are, who have enrolled in this process. And then, if you see, uh, there are a lot of value added products that can be obtained uh, by the jaggery as as its base. And then, and then again, there is an option of having a, a semi-automatic equipment or also the automatic equipment. So, so, uh, so, the, uh, so then, uh, equipment 
is a is a must if you want to go for the uh, the commercial production or as an entrepreneur if you want to go for the uh, the high end production we need to select the right kind of equipment and then and then a lot of value added product it can be uh, it can be made so so we got uh, this is a semi automatic equipment or if you want to go for the fully automatic equipment also uh, this is one of the option uh, this is one of the slide which is showing the fully automatic equipment in case of chicky making jaggery uh, no a uh, jaggery as the main ingredient so so what i just wanted to tell this to you with the limitation of time and then also there is a standard protocols that are available for different product example this kandasari and jaggery so there are different is codes that are available if you are a manufacturer you have to you please have a look at this at this uh, at this uh, at the standards if you know if you want to produce uh, the product you also can look at at, at this product so with this uh, a small introduction and within the stipulated time i have i completed my time i complete my talk and then i acknowledge all these institutions who are working in jaggery processing and then who have supported supported me thank you any thank any you particular much. question you can ask i sir, think sir, i was sir, i, think I was on time yes, okay sir, thank sir. you thank you yes sir we take up the question at the end of the session sir thank you uh, thank you thank you, thank you so I much sir day. for accept uh, yeah. for such a valuable information and knowledge now we are moving to the next technical talk which is on which is on the opportunities for value addition in coffee for this session we have with us dr mandapa im division head coffee quality coffee board bangalore i would like quickly to introduce you sir he is currently a certified q grader from a coffee quality institute usc and a coffee quality specialist who analyzes a uh, coffee for the organoleptic biochemical composition in association to their uh, quality parameters he is also in charge in the of the analytical, uh, analytical laboratory at the coffee board head office in bangalore his current research interests interest revolve around coffee quality improvement processing as well as the development of early onset detection of acrotoxin mm -hmm. a during the various stages of, of coffee harvesting processing and storage i welcome you sir and thank you for accepting our invitation the session is over to you sir uh, good, uh, good good afternoon to everybody and thank you niftem for inviting me for this talk i will not waste any time and uh, basically present uh, just to give you a basic introduction coffee to india was introduced uh, the story goes back that a sufi saint by the name baba budan introduced the first seven beans to india it is from these seven beans that the coffees of india have propagated is what the story says but uh, the credit should go to the british entrepreneurs who introduced commercial cultivation of coffee and today india is the sixth largest producer and the seventh largest when it comes to production of uh, coffee in india uh, the coffee market in india is growing at an exponential rate i heard one of the earlier speakers mention at around 8.5% so it's growing anywhere between 6 to 8% and there's a huge demand for value addition when it comes to coffee uh, there have been lot of issues when it comes to labor in the plantation sector and various other uh, other aspects thank you the slides are visible now can you please go to the next slide please they are basically grown in the western and the eastern ghat regions this uh, has a very sig important significance uh, when it comes to coffee it protects the fragile ecosystem of the western ghats which is one of the 25 hot uh, spots for biodiversity we have a lot of endemic species of both flora and fauna which is protected indirectly uh, with the coffee estates which house a large number of native as well as timber yielding and fruiting trees along with coffee which is grown under the shaded system i think the slides are missing again yeah. anyway uh, to give you a rough estimation again one of the speakers touched upon this india roughly produces about 3 and 1/2 uh, metric tons uh, lakh metric tons per year of coffee and this figure is also slowly increasing although we have reached a point of stagnation in our traditional areas we have introduced coffee in the northeast and in on the andhra region 
which is slowly adding to our kitty. And uh, last year we had record in terms of the export earnings we've got. We got close to a billion in terms of export earnings from coffee last year. So this shows that there's a lot of potential for coffee in the future. Next, please. Some of the uniqueness of the Indian coffee system or the Indian coffees is what why I want to highlight this before I go on to value addition is all these add as USPs for you to basically market your product better, which the previous speaker spoke about. And also when you have to value add a product, all these factors make an impact in the final product you have to sell. Uh, all our coffees in India are shade grown under a two tire shade system. Uh, our coffees are handpicked. There's very limited uh, scope for mechanization when it comes to coffees of India. Our coffees, thanks to the abundance in our coffee growing regions, basically sun dried off late with uh, the change in climate and these climate change uh, happening in a small way. There are small mechanical dryers coming into the picture, uh, which, of course, from a quality angle is not very uh, suitable, but again, from an entrepreneurial angle, it's very essential that mechanical dryers are produced within the country. Most of our coffees are grown in the western and the eastern ghats, like I mentioned, at high elevations. And uh, they help in protecting the rich biodiversity there, soils and the biodiversity there. Most of our practices are eco-friendly, where we use very limited uh, fertilizer or pesticide when it comes to coffee. Our beans, since they're grown at higher elevations under shade, mature slowly and become dense, uh, adding all that more flavor and body and character to the cup. Next, please. Quickly, these are, as you know, India is a very dark regions. We have coffee majorly in the south of India, what you see on the map. We also have the northeast and certain parts of the Andhra and the Odisha belt, which has coffee. We have 13 coffee growing regions which have very distinct logos for each of these regions. We have uh, three specialty grades which I'll talk about in my next slide. Next, please. Uh, these are the, India has a distinction of growing both Arabica and Robusta. These are the two different coffee varieties which we grow uh, in the country. Uh, some of the countries only grow Arabica or most are uh, Robusta. Uh, we grow both, which adds uh, character and we have more to offer to the global market or to the domestic market as well. The Arabicas are the finer of the two coffees when it comes to the cup. Next, please. The Robustas, I wouldn't call them the more harsher, but the more bolder, the more robust coffees, which adds a lot of body, a lot of cocoa and chocolate notes uh, into the coffee. And it is very sought after in an espresso blend, which is being very popular these days. And we can proudly say that India produces some of the finest robustas in the country. Coming to the classification, coffee is classified as per the Indian Coffee Board standards into 25 commercial grades. And most of the classification happens on the, uh, happens on the process by which the coffee is processed post-harvest. We have something called as washed harvest where the coffee cherries are harvested. Then the outer pulp is removed and then it's passed through a washer to give you washed coffee or your parchment coffee. After the next process is your natural coffee or your cherry coffee where your ripe cherries are harvested, the sun dried and then hulled to give you your natural coffees. You have something called as the honey processed coffees or the pulp sun dried coffees. Honey process doesn't necessarily indicate that you add honey to it. It just indicates the mucilage, the sticky layer in the coffee bean, which we refer to as honey, where the coffee is pulped and sun dried directly and not washed to retain that mucilage, to give it a unique character in the cup. Next, please. These are some of, these are our specialty coffees. India has three specialty coffees based on the grade. Uh, we have classified a washed Arabica coffee, and it is popularly known as the Mysore Nuggets Extra Bold, uh, which is a premium grade washed Arabica coffee, which is bold and has good acidity and flavor and a hint of spice in the cup. Next, please. We have a Robusta Kapi Royal. Like I said, we, India produces some of the finest Robusta coffees. It is a premium grade Robusta with very bold beans, which gives you a soft, very robust and clean cup. Next, please. 
the monsoon malabar coffee is a very interesting coffee this is a gi tagged coffee as well this coffee is a specially processed coffee nowadays earlier the story goes that earlier most of our coffee was shipped through the sea route to most of the uh, to these far off destinations uh, specifically the scandinavian countries during the journey the coffee was exposed to the monsoon winds and they resulted in the coffee beans being a little bloated a little bleached imparting very specific characters in this cup of very sort of earthiness nuttiness in the flavor and nama schedule padi yaar varagi irukku and the next uh, and this in turn has resulted in the cup being well appreciated by international market this is done in the malabar coast technically between the manglo and calicut on the southern coast next please can you please move to the, yeah these are our gi registered coffees this is again a good importance for an entrepreneur he can uh, obtain these gi tags from the gi registry chennai with the help of the coffee board and you can use these uh, gi tagged coffees and market them and brand them to produce a new value added product next please with this brief introduction of the coffees of india i come to the main aspect of this session where it is basically to give you the various opportunities you have to value add when it comes to coffee so let me put it this way value addition in when it comes to coffee starts all the way from the farm and it ends up finally in the cup so the grower is the first person who can value add the second is the green coffee buyer or an importer or an exporter of this country from the of coffee the th third is the coffee roaster who adds value by roasting the coffee to bring about those fantastic aromas and flavors the fourth is the barista or the uh, barista is a person who brews your coffee who is the bartender behind the bar brewing your fine cups of coffee and ultimately it's the consumer which is buying your coffee and who is so all these players in the value chain are very very important and these are every sector every aspect of these of this value chain has entrepreneurial opportunities and scope for value addition next please so like i said we'll go one at a time value addition at the farm level i said starts from a grower you have like i said in india we grow both arabica and robusta you can have segregated blocks as a farmer to grow value added coffee in terms of a specific variety uh, maybe a high grown coffee and then sell it as an estate branded or a specialty coffee a specialty coffee is a coffee on a cupping table when you cup or taste the coffee uh, on a scale of uh, 0 to 100 it scores 80 and above a coffee which scores 80 and above is a specialty coffee there is a lot of demand for these niche specialty coffees coming from unique growing regions of the country and because of the cup characters they possess they command a premium price so your value addition for a farmer can start right here by producing some fine specialty coffees when it comes to the estate uh, again or a coffee growing region you i just mentioned that most of our coffees are hand picked and through manual labor there are a lot of scope for entrepreneurs to have value addition uh, in terms of bringing mechanical interventions to say harvesting which takes up most of our labor force in the maximum during the harvest season you can uh, fabricate new weed cutters to various interventions or maybe even uh, manuring options between the rows of coffee of course the terrain is uh, difficult to handle so something to counter on those lines is what there is Im immense scope for an engineer to basically value add in machinery or mechanical interventions in the coffee farm the third thing you can look at right at the farm level is value addition through various certification programs you have something called as the rainforest alliance certificate or your organic certification you have a bird friendly certification from the smithsonian bird institute the gi coffees i spoke about you can have these certification bodies come evaluate your farms give obtain these certifications and then command a better premium in the market for the green coffee you sell 
the innovation for machinery at, in the coffee plantation like i mentioned earlier is the most important because we do have very little mechan mechanical interventions currently and most of the manufacturer now are from abroad so there is a lot of scope for make in india kind of an initiative here next please coming to the post harvest at the farm level this is a very very critical step after you harvest the coffee is right post harvesting harvest processing adds a lot of value to coffee and the green beans you produce this is where what i mentioned earlier the speciality coffee comes into the picture the way you process your coffee in the dry wet or the semi washed method the is very very critical in what the cup score is or what the cup ends up in the final product and based on your cup score and the way the flavors and aromas come out in the cup you get better premiums or you fall under the speciality segment based on the cup profile this is very essential for a farmer which where he can uh, follow very stringent post harvest practices to enable him to reach a speciality coffee grade premiums again and value add to his regular commercial coffee coming to the mechanical interventions again post harvest you have lot of machinery such as the coffee pulping machines the drying machines what i mentioned earlier all these machines currently are produced by big producers from brazil and uh, from colombia which is some some of the major producing countries when it comes to arabica there is a lot of scope for a make in india initiative here to make cheaper more efficient more practical oriented uh, pulping machines more efficient machines uh, when it comes to these post harvest machinery there are a lot of fermentation techniques like what wine uses now uh, which has been introduced to coffee to improve the cup profiles so there is a scope for say and even a microbiologist to basically come up with some fantastic yeast uh, or a cultures or a consortium to basically add uh, character to the cup in terms of the ferment coffee is falling the other most important factor when it comes to coffee is moisture there are the most the most important thing for coffee is it should have a specific moisture level to prevent mold growth or any spoilage or staling of the coffee we have lot of moisture meters which are currently in the market again which are mostly imported there is a scope for make in india moisture meters some of them have already started making make in india moisture meters no doubt but that doesn't end there there is a lot of scope to develop make in india moisture meters which are cheap more efficient and which serve the purpose at the farm level which uh, an entrepreneur can explore to value add to his coffee produce next please so all what i spoke about was at the farm level from the farm the coffee goes through another secondary processing in a coffee curing works or a coffee dry mill here you have a whole array of different machines the outer pulp outer parchment layer or the outer skin or the uh, or the cherry coat is removed at this stage you have lot of machines like i have mentioned uh, mentioned here uh, when it comes to the coffee curing machines like the vinoa the hulla the grader the ketodos again most of this of course comes from abroad some of them are fabricated within the country <clears throat> but there is a scope for developing a cheap electronic color sorter the color sorter is a machine which basically sorts the green beans based on the color so a defective bean which is black or brown needs to be separated from the good green greenish blue or greenish gray beans uh, which we generally produce as a green coffee currently most of the color sorting machines are all made abroad there is tremendous scope to uh, create a electronic sorting machine which is cheaper more economical more practical and more efficient in house under the make in india program and there's a lot of scope for entrepreneurship here when it comes to the color sorting machine at the curing level the next please when it the next stage after you cure your coffee and you obtain your clean coffee or your green coffee the next stage in the value uh, addition is roasting when it comes to coffee there are various roasting manufacturers there is a whole array of micro roasters and cafes coming up in the country all of you all are aware of it it is exponentially growing both domestically and abroad and there is tremendous scope for you to set up a cafe 
for you to set up a cafe, you first need to roast your coffee to be able to brew it, grind it and brew it and serve it to the end customer. Again, most of the more roasting machines are imported currently. You have big German brands uh, manufacturing some of these machines in India. Why not a roasting machine which is economical and practical and efficient in India? There is tremendous scope to scale down. Currently, most of the roasting machines are commercial scale. There is a demand for tabletop or small roasting machines, be it electrical or gas fired. The principles are very simple. It works on the principle of basic principles of conduction, convection and radiation. There is also scope for all adding alternate fuels now. This is the age where we are very, uh, very careful about what fuel, fuel we use to, to reduce the carbon emissions. You can use alternate fuels like hydrogen or other fuels for your roasting machine, which is also another area where entrepreneurs can basically target and uh, basically add value here. Coming to the grinding machines, the same issue again, most of the grinders are imported. It is very simple to have a good grinding machine, which is new. When it comes to brewing equipment, this market is evolving at a phenomenal pace, uh, pace currently in the country. Brewing of pure roast and ground coffee is become a fad now. Uh, I mean, in a way, thanks to COVID, there was a surge in home brewers who wanted all these equipment in their home. There is a lot of innovation still left when it comes to coffee vending machines. Currently, we have bean to cup machines, but we don't have a powder to cup machine, which is very practical or very efficient currently. That is something people as entrepreneurs can explore to add value to your final product. You have various brewing methods, various tabletop brewing methods, your espresso brewing method. There is scope for you to develop new brewing, practical brewing methods. There is a new demand for coffee capsules. These are small capsules which are made with currently with a aluminum and some plastic material. There is scope to make these coffee capsules more eco-friendly. Maybe you can use another plant plantation crop like say an Ereka waste or maybe even coffee husk or coffee pulp to make these capsules and uh, store coffee in them and use them as uh, coffee capsule machines, what you see here. Then you have coffee bags, drip bags, like tea bags which you dip in. Here you have bags which you open up and then you pour water on top and brew your coffee. These coffee bags are currently being manufactured majorly in Taiwan. There is a lot of scope for manufacturing these coffee bags within India as well under the Make in India scheme or various uh, schemes what are in offer for the plantation sector to add value. The next uh, slide, please. Coming to value addition and the final product development, you all must have all, all heard about green coffee and uh, this whole buzz around how it's very good for health and it has a whole array of antioxidants. No doubt green coffee, although not scientifically proven to be extremely safe, is a good alternative like green tea as an anti-obesity agent. This is again being marketed widely as a product. But again, certain studies are still required to determine what percentage of green coffee is good for you or not. This is just the green beans or the clean beans which are ground and brewed and consumed. The value addition majorly in coffee happens in the roasted form. So just roasting your coffee is a very, very big step in value addition. To give you an example, for example, if a green coffee, a kg of green coffee costs you around 400 or 450 rupees in today's uh, market, uh, the same quantity of one kg roasted bean will uh, will be will uh, you can charge anywhere between 600 to 1,200 rupees. So immediately there is value addition when you roast, and unless you roast the coffee, you cannot get the beautiful aromas or the flavors out of the coffee. And that is when you brew it and then you give it to the final consumer. This is an important step in the value addition which people can explore. The second is instant coffee. It's basically your brews and Nescafe's. It's a very different process where the coffee is already brewed, then it is freeze dried, and then it is packed and the aromas which are trapped are again released into the bottle to give you instant coffee. Currently, most of the instant coffee plants are large plants. There is a whole 
new area where you can explore making small instant coffee plants for your smaller produce right at the farm level maybe which can add value and this is again a very good entrepreneurial opportunity decaffeinated coffee is very popular abroad in india there are no not many decaffeination plants this is one more area where there can be a lot of value addition and a lot of entrepreneurial opportunities to set up a decaffeinated liquid coffee and ready to drink coffees are gaining popularity popularity these days you have liquid coffee decoction in uh, sachets you must have seen the id coffees and certain other brands come up with it although most of these technologies are not yet fully fine tuned there is scope for developing the packaging material i think there's a speaker speaking on packaging material to uh, preserve the shelf life of a liquid coffee which is prone to more microbial infestation so there is scope here to value add by making liquid coffee ready to drink coffees in cans or sachets and a whole array more can you go to the next slide please oh uh, sorry to interrupt you sir yeah. sir we have yeah. a shortage of time can you yeah i'm done please? i just have another slide to go okay sir. can you please move to the next slide so other than the coffees what you find in india you have your estate branded organic fair trade and like i mentioned based on the scoring you you can add value with processing next slide please so coming after i conclude my talk here this is some of the facilities we have at the coffee board in uh, housed in bangalore at the quality division you can send your samples for analysis we have can you move to the next slide please we have a state of the art testing facility we have an analytical laboratory next please next please and we offer a whole array of uh, skill building programs and entrepreneurship training programs here at the coffee board which uh, you as uh, young entrepreneurs i see most of them are a lot of students here and who want to add value in coffee and all these programs what we offer what you see here which is available on our website as well is what you all can come and make take benefit of with this i end my talk and i thank niftem and the organizers for giving me this opportunity as well uh thank you so much sir for such a valuable information and the yeah. knowledge you share with us i think coffee yeah. lovers will definitely make a startup on this now moving we now we are moving towards on the next session next technical talk which is on cashew processing and value addition in india viable opportunities and emerging ch challenges for this we have with us dr d bala subramaniam principal scientist in icer directorate of cashew research putu uh let me introduce to you uh 22 years of experience in agro processing as a researcher consultant educator and operational researcher in leading organization in india with icar nwdpra having a sound knowledge of complex processing technique in uh cereal pulses spices narcotics fruits and vegetables and oil seeds and investigated extensively in crop processing his research papers has been published in more than 38 research papers 10 book chapters 8 popular article articles and 10 consultancy provided and has two patent file cashew nut processing pro, uh, processing process product and machinery development by product utilization of cashew cashew apple shell and tester preservation and storage non destructive quality evaluation and intellectual property i welcome you sir and thank you for in, in accepting our invitation the session is over to you sir a good afternoon to one and all and at the outset i would like to thank the organizers for having invited me to present on the topic cashew processing and value addition in india viable opportunities and emerging challenges in fact due to paucity of time let me focus on cashew nut processing alone because uh, other than that one the by products like cashew apple and the cashew nut shell liquid and other things uh, it may not be possible to cover in this particular half i mean the 20 minute session let me once again let me tell you that it will be focused on cashew nut processing well cashew is basically it is not belonging to india and brazil is actually the place where the cashew originated and the portuguese travelers in the second half of the 15th century brought it to india in the beginning cashew was actually the tree was utilized or it was used for conserving the soil but later on understanding the potential of the cashew nut 
the first two i mean one it is actually taken up on all over the world is from india they processed raw cashew nut to convert or extract the cashew kernel for edible purpose at present 32 countries are producing the raw cashew nut in a commercial way and when we look at the total global production of cashew it is uh, ivory coast in the west africa india and vietnam put together uh, produces 60 percent of the global production whereas uh, 40 percent of the production from other areas uh, especially from east and western africa of other countries when we look at the production scenario from 1961 onwards during 1961 2.48 lakh metric tons of raw cashew nut produced and the last fiscal the cashew nut production was actually uh, recorded as 37.5 lakh metric tons so this clearly indicates the phenomenal growth in the production of raw cashew nut a 15 times growth in the production since 1961 so what does it mean it means even at the production level itself the profitability is there and just because why we have to go for production there should be a consumption increase or the people around the world are very much attracted in consuming the cashew kernel that might i must be one of the reasons why very many farmers have started cultivating the cashew when we look at the world consumption of cashew kernels it uh, i mean amounts to 8.29 lakh metric tons in a year that is in the last fiscal and 36 percent by india it may be surprising you that whether we indians are consuming to the extent of 36 percent it is amounts to 2.5 lakh metric tons it is true and when i talk about all these things in the i mean uh, forthcoming slides i you will better understand about it and when we look at the processing facility that is developed in this country in the peninsula region starting from the gujarat in the west coast to the west bengal in the east coast around 14 to 15 states are involved in the cashew processing system 40 percent of the global production is actually processed in this country which amounts to approximately 16 lakh metric tons of raw cashew nut. well whether we are interested to take cashew kernel, consume cashew kernel, or anybody want to start the cashew, I mean, related pro, uh, activities, one should know the nutritive value of the cashew. Then only they will be preferring to take the cashew kernel because this is the one thing that the corona, it has taught us the best lesson. Today, very many people are having the awareness on health, I mean, personal health. So uh, before going for consuming certain things, it has become a habit looking at the label that what is the content of the particular product so when you look at the cashew and uh, it is liked by many people of all works of life just because it's flavor and taste and this is one of the best uh, i mean wonderful gift by the i mean brought to the mankind it okay, when you look at the nutritive value of the cashew it has got the calorific value of 553 calories it is a moderate one and it's so sugar content is six gram which is actually very much helpful that people having the diabetic problem and uh, those who are having the constipation problem problem definitely it has got the fiber especially the dietary fiber to the extent of 3.3 percent and uh, when you look at the composition of the cashew it has got 47 percent fat well when i say 47 percent of fat everybody will be raising their eyebrows whether to be consumed out of this 47 percent fat 82 percent is unsaturated fatty acid mostly olic and the palmitolic acid which will not lead to the formation of the cholesterol therefore many physicians they advocate to uh, to consume the cashew kernel to the extent of 25 to 30 grams even the people who are having the uh, cardiac ailments but and at the same time it is uh, pro i mean promoted cashew is promoted in the market as a zero cholesterol man but i don't agree with that one because 82 percent only the unsaturated fatty, fatty acid and remaining 18 percent are saturated fatty acid so we may have to say that it is a low cholesterol net rather than a zero cholesterol net and it has got 21 percent protein 24 percent 24 percent carbohydrate and remaining eight percent is vitamin and minerals and it is actually as a rich source of copper, magnesium, and magnesium, these are, which are all very much important for brain health, immunity, and bone health. Everybody knows about it. And that is the one thing that has come, that come from cashew. And when we look at today, everybody talk about antioxidant, right? Selenium, selenium is a one important thing. And it's a powerful antioxidant present in cashew to the tune of 19.9 microgram. And uh, when uh, 
I mean, during the corona period, when somebody is infected and get admitted in the hospital, there are two tablets that is given for, uh, I mean, infected people. One is actually vitamin C, another one is zinc content. When we look at cashew as a whole, zinc is available in cashew kernel, zinc is available to the tune of 5.78 milligram. So, which is essential to boost the immunity. And another way, when you look at the cashew apple, it has got 274 milligrams for every 100 grams of cashew apple juice. So, eating cashew apple and the cashew kernel, it enhances the immunity of our body system. Let us have a quick uh, look at the global production of cashew. What is the India, India's contribution? India stands in the third position as far as the information gathered from FAO uh, for the year 2021. Next to, uh, it is in the second position, of course, uh, the, uh, next to that Ivory Coast in the uh, West Africa, India's contribution is 21.7 percentage. Of course, very recently, we, uh, we got the information that, uh, I mean, uh, near to Vietnam, there is a country by name Cambodia, which is which was not at all there in the cashew map. Now it is able to produce eight to nine lakh metric tons of pro cashew nut. So one has to look at what is the growth that is taking place and the importance given for the raw cashew nut. So when we look at the I mean, a domestic production of production in Maharashtra stands uh, in the first position with a 33% contribution in the total national production. And though Kerala stood in the first position a couple of decades ago, now because uh, most of the trees have become senile trees and uh, the production potential has gone down and uh, replanting is going on in many places. So it may take, uh, I mean, some more time for Kerala to, I mean, move their position to the better one. Well, when we start any processing or any business or something, there will be resistance from the market. As far as uh, the cashew is concerned, eight different tree nuts are available and they're commercially available in the market, starting from almond, uh, I mean, brazil nut, cashew, hazel, macadamia, pecan, pine, pistachio, and walnuts. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, 8.29 lakh metric tons of uh, cashew kernel is consumed and uh, its growth rate, that is CAGR, is registered as 8.45 percentage in the global level and it is really a, a promoting one for uh, people who are in the cashew business and next to almond and the walnut cashew stands in the third position as far as its preference is concerned all over the world let us have a look at the cashew su supply and value chain because when you look at the cashew processing 70 and uh, especially the working cost or the processing cost, 75% of the total cost goes for the raw cash net. One has to give important or uh, vitally it is very much uh, important, we have to go for a good quality raw cash net. And at the same time, what is the quantity available for processing to make the cash factory to run throughout the year. And when you look at it, Vietnam, Vietnam is the one country which has entered into the cash field just 20 years ago. But you just look at it, the, the total production of that, uh, I mean, Vietnam, of course, it is in the third position next to India. But how much quantity it is exported from other country, it showed actually uh, interest in processing the raw cash net. Of course, uh, the cultivation aspect, it has gone to the secondary level. And look at the export of cashew kernel. To the extent what it is exported, it is almost 2 point. Uh, I mean, 3.35 uh, lakh metric ton till it is exported. Of course, uh, Sassan chairman mentioned that in the beginning, India, almost for the last four years or something, it is standing in the first position for exporting the cashew kernel, but slightly on the other side, it is actually diminishing. And uh, just because the domestic consumption become very, very strong in India, and most of the, I mean, people who are processing the country in other parts of the world, they are concentrating on India, how to transfer the, I mean, cashew kernel to India for the better market. You look at India, India process 16.43 lakh metric tons and the total quantity produced is 3.45. And as I mentioned, 2.82 lakh metric tons it is consumed in India and average per capita consumption amounts to 275 milli, I mean, gram per, I mean, individual. It is much, much better, I mean, more than, uh, I mean, United, I mean, citizen of the United States of America. And, uh, the, may, the major thing, the, what we have to look at here, the domestic consumption of the cashew kernel has got a very strong domestic consumption. So one need not look for exporting the cashew kernel following stringent rules and regarding the grade and other things, packaging and other, uh, other activities. So it's very well moving in the internal market and very many people, that is the reason very many people plunge into the business to harvest the maximum benefit.
and just that sort. The Cambodia is one country. Now its production has uh, potential has increased to nine lakh metric tons. Well, when we look at the production, processing, and uh, the export of cashew kernel from India, that's what the import of cashew from India. The production in the beginning of the century it started with uh, just seven lakh metric tons. And when you look at 2020-21, it is almost 15.22 lakh metric tons. What does it indicate? Yes, no doubt about it. Cashew processing is a lucrative business, highly profitable one. That is why very many people, I mean, enter into the business and started working on that one. So that is what I just want to mention about it. But another thing what I want to mention in the beginning, probably for the last, I mean, 10 years or something from the beginning of uh, century up to 2011 or something, the production potential, especially the domestic production was higher. But later on, when you look at it, the domestic production, it is not diminished. It was insufficient. The, it is almost maintained same, but import of raw cash net that, I mean, increased just because very many cash factories started in India and not only in, I mean, production catchment, even any other places. Today, you can, I mean, get information that cash factory started in Punjab and Haryana, even Delhi. So where not even a single nut is available, they have started cash processing. So what does it mean? Once again, I just want to, I mean, pinpoint that it is a profitable industry. It's very many people, once again, I mean, it has got a good scope for even a small scale cash processors or entrepreneurs. This is to highlight what is the domestic concept of cashew kernel in the beginning of the century and at present. In the beginning, it was hardly 50% or 49% or something like that. And today, our consumption rate in a domestic level increased to 86 and only 14% of the total, I mean, uh, manufactured cashew kernels are exported from this country. So it has uh, developed a strong production, for, I mean, the consumption pattern in India. It helps us uh, for many small scale industries to get involved in cashew nut processing. Well, put it in a nutshell, around, I mean, more than 6,200 industries in the East and West Coast constitute cashew processing sector in India, and its processing capacity is uh, 20 lakh, more than 20 lakh metric tons. And uh, I mean, a couple of years ago, the maximum production potential was around 16 lakh metric tons. And uh, earlier it used to be more, and at present 28% of the total uh, processor constitute that, I mean, they are the manufacturer exporters. And when we look at the small and the large, I mean, the category, I mean, uh, uh, the, I mean, scale of processing based on the quantum of process, I mean, uh, processing at their location, it, uh, I mean, uh, recorded 67% and 8%. The important thing is, I just want to mention the 67%. Small scale processes are dominating in this country. That's what I just want to mention about it. And domestic consumption, as I mentioned earlier, 49 to I mean, increase from 49% to 83%. At present, the, the major problem in this country is the labor scarcity. Of course, no doubt, irrespective of the, I mean, uh, the commodity or the processing things are concerned. So gradually, the mechanization is uh, taking, up, I mean, uh, entry into the cashew processing system. And many of the people, they have either uh, changed the cashew processing system partially based on the availability of the laborers or very many people converted into fully automated industries. And as far as the value addition is concerned, immediate, I mean, after extracting the cashew kernel, it is exported in a plain form. Because just to get the immediate money, it is all happening in the such, such a way. But in order to enhance the profit, one need to go for value addition to get the better benefit for that one. And byproduct utilization, as far as the Apple is concerned, it is not replaced to the maximum possible. And CNSL also, it is only the crude oil that is extracted from uh, cashew nut shell after extracting the kernel and uh, the card or cardinal or salicylic acid, whatever it may be, it is not isolated from them to go for uh, preparation of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, paint or varnish or resin or uh, industrial product from. Uh, this particular uh, basic industrial material. The major constraint as far as cashew is concerned, inadequate supply of raw cash net, as I mentioned, showed in the bar diagram itself, and financial support. Of course, now it is all available through MSME schemes and uh, PFME scheme. So one can avail the facility when they want to go for uh, women-based cashew net processing or uh, another one is a small scale level where it doesn't even attract the collateral security. Labor scarcity is a problem, but uh, this is addressed by developing the 
machinery suitable for cash and processing in the different stages of one and the capacity utilization 50 to 70 percent because of the availability of raw cash net yes uh, it is in general irrespective of the commodity as far as the cashew business is concerned it can be started the, the first operation option what is available is the supply of raw cash net connecting the producers and processors. Yeah, POs are started uh, in a cooperative way. They are doing that way. And the next one is the primary cash unit processing. And uh, which one I will be dealing about it in, uh, I mean, another few slides. That is extract of the edible kernel for, I mean, uh, supplying to the market. Third one is that the byproduct of the cashew, that is cashew apple processing. Well, as far as this one is concerned, when is the only thing product that is made out of cashew and uh, with a GI tag only, uh, Goa is actually able to prepare and uh, uh, market it in the, I mean, uh, in Goa elsewhere in the world. Whereas uh, because of the excise duty in other states, the uh, people are not interested to start it. Uh, but in my opinion, instead of going for alcoholic beverage, non-alcoholic beverage based product needs to be developed, uh, which will get the, I mean, which should have that the consumer attraction and move in the market in that direction, certain uh, products have been identified, especially the vacuum fried chips and the extrude prepared out of the cashew apple powder or, uh, um, I mean, the area in which we are concentrating on in a few, I mean, months it will be launched for, uh, I mean, uh, the consumer as well as the technology will be available for the entrepreneurs to get into that one. And value addition of cashew, it is not given much importance. Of course, uh, uh, when I talk about that one, let me uh, dealt in detail about it. The marketing of cashew product, just like uh, sourcing the raw cashew net, the people are need to be there for to connect the people at the same time when they Cashew kernels are available and from the processor, it can be transferred to the location, especially for bakery and so many other food, I mean, uh, processing industry, it can be connected so that uh, people can uh, earn more money out of it. Well, let me start with the, I mean, growing pattern of the cashew. This is starting from the flowering stage to the completely ripened apple. This is actually the 35th day when the, the raw cashew net, which grows first, it reaches the maximum uh, growth. And afterwards, it starts uh, diminishing in size. Whereas this is the pedicel portion where the accumulation of the nutrient that will be taking place, it starts bulging it. So that is the peculiar phenomena as far as the cashew is concerned. After 35th day, the nuts will be shrinking and the apple will be expanding and only after complete may i mean ripening of the apple nut should be harvested to have more maturity on that one that will yield better quality of the cashew kernel at the end of processing so this is in general what is cashew nut cashew processing it is divided into nut processing and apple processing and the raw cashew nut needs to be conditioned to extract the kernel after deselling, we get that unpeeled cashew kernel and what is left over is actually the shell and uh, the kernel has got the tester layer on the surface it is uh, having a tan i mean a tannin content along with it one it cannot be consumed so in order to remove that sir i mean a tester layer on the surface it need to go another uh, i mean a stage of operation that is simply a drying process to loosen that surface uh, uh, i mean layer and either manually or mechanically the surface layer the tester will be removed later on the edible kernel will be available the ultimate aim in cashew processing is to extract white whole kernel that is very very important because it fetches premium price in the market when we look at the cashew shell byproduct when you just go for i mean expellers you can crush it and extract the cnsl there are 2450 patents are available as far as the product which can be prepared out of cnsl and hardly few patents are available on machinery and value added product from cashew kernel. It shows that the importance of CNSL and probably the anacardic acid from which the proanthocyanidin that can be extracted, that is actually the area it needs a lot of uh, attention. And if you are able to get the pro and I mean uh, uh, proanthocyanidin, uh, which can be which can cure the cancer at the fourth level. And that is one area, I mean, even uh, entrepreneurs can think of it or a startup can be. I mean, initiated. And once the CNSL is extracted, the leftover is cashew shell cake. And uh, this can be made into briquettes as a fuel briquette, or otherwise, it can, with a, I mean, gasifier, the just like LPG, liquefied petroleum gas, the producer gas or sink gas that can be generated from this particular one. Well, sir, the basics of. Sorry yes. to interrupt you, sir. Sir, we yeah, have a shortage yeah. of time. So, can you wind up the session? As soon right as now, let me go to the final one. Yes, I'm fine uh, because. Yeah. Okay. These are the eight different stages. Uh, 
the cashew nut has to undergo to extract the edible kernel for processing, drying raw cashew nut storage, conditioning raw, raw cashew nut, deshelling, kernel drying, peeling, and grading and packaging. And of course, secondary processing is value addition by product utilization. And let me just run the slides, and that way you can just understand this is the raw cashew nut processing. Okay, this is uh, the sun. I mean, raw cashew nut having a moisture content of 17% uh, should be brought to 8%, which is considered to be the safer level moisture level. And uh, once it is dried under sun for two to three days, it can be packed in a sizzle bag to, I mean, keep it for longer time because it's a seasonal product. It needs to be stored for longer time. And these are the three important parameters to be considered as far as the raw cash net is concerned. That is, moisture content should be 8%. And nut count, it is number of runs in 1 kg. And outer, it indicates the total quantity of cashew kernel that is inside the shell. And these are the two different types of uh, steaming machine available, especially because uh, in the harvested land, when you go for shelling it, uh, the kernel will be breaking it. In order to extract the kernel in whole form, this conditioning operation is very much essential. And uh, this is one thing, vertical, this is actually vertical type. This, uh, I mean, uh, steam generating unit, and this is actually cooking vessel. And this is the one developed in Vietnam. It's a rotary one. And uh, there it is actually horizontal type, uh, heat, I mean, steam generating unit are uh, used for that one. So have a look at it. This is how the shelling process started in the beginning and how the lady is doing it. I, I mean, it is almost high, unhygienic way. And uh, it is improved in this fashion. It is a uh, hand -come pedal operated machine. How it is operated, drudgery is the basic reason for that one to promote this one to a mechanized one. Have a look at it. A motor is connected in that one in such a way that only the feeding of the nuts is done and to extract the cell. And finally, this is a completely automated one. The nuts are lifted one by one and to shell the rock edge net. And this is placed between the two blades uh, kept in horizontal way to pass and uh, make a slit. And finally, the Y blade split the rock edge net. And, by, and finally, you get the cashew kernel. And here, the capacity is 30 kg per. It all depends on the scale of processing. And once it is, as I mentioned, once it is actually, the kernels are extracted, it has got a tester layer on the top. The, here, in order to extract, I mean, uh, peel off the cashew kernel tester, it has to undergo a process of uh, drying the cashew kernel. This is externally generated hot air that will be circulated. And this is steam assisted uh, dryer. Steam is replaced for drying the cashew kernel and through the radiator assembly. And this is the peeling operation. And this is a manual pooling, but of course, it is a very high, unhygienic way. This is with the stainless steel blades, how fast it is happening. Their capacity is 7 to 14 kg per day, per head. And this is an automatic system. By pneumatic pressure itself, they are able to peel the tester layer. And finally, the grading operation. Here, it is manual grading. And this is actually the size grader. And the singulation of the one is a very attractive one. How the cashew kernels are picked up by aspiration mechanism and uh, taken to this one. This is based on, uh, I mean, algorithm technique that is followed for that one. This is once again, this is actually to grade the cashew kernels of a lower grade, especially the splits, J J that is jumbo half and the baby bits. And finally, even after peeling, along with the peel, some, there may be some cashew kernel that will go along with that one. Do I mean, following the destoner uh, mechanism, the Testo is uh, separated and the cashew kernels of uh, smaller one is also expected from that one. You can just have a look at it. And grading of the cashew kernel, 23 internationally accepted grades are, uh, I mean, uh, uh, separated or it is graded at the final grading section. And it is based on the size, wholesomeness and the surface color characteristics. There are two different types of packaging technique followed. One is actually the tin container. Another one is vacuum packaging technique. Just to have a look at it, this is a transparent, uh, I mean, packaging technique. It's, uh, I mean, string packaging with which the cost of the processing is very much reduced. This was developed by Vandin Company from South Africa. Now it is very much followed in India. And most of the importing countries have a stringent rule that it should be packed in this particular fashion and exported to their countries. These are the value added product from cashew kernel as a whole kernel. It can be eaten in a natural form or roasted. Yes, once the cashew kernel is uh, roasted and salted, that one can release that particular product. And these are the process, I mean, pieces that goes in uh, con confectioner and bakery, even in a, as a part of sweets or something. And finally, it can be converted into beverage. And these are all happening. Why it is happening? Just to enhance the profitability and the nutrient availability in the cashew. These are some other cashew, value-added cashew, cashew kernel. And these are the two machines that are used for coating of cashew. 
And this is the one thing I just want to focus on that when with the two lakh rupees, one can start a cashew processing, I mean, a setup in their location. If the space requirement is five into four meter only, and uh, there are 3,000 such units are available in Maharashtra, especially started by women's self help group. And uh, they are all, and uh, another one is Women Cooperative Society, and uh, that is the name of Kudumbasri in Kerala. It is actually functioning at, uh, I mean, a very successful way. In 2009, it started. In 2023, they made three crore as a, I mean, a profit. And the cluster-based processing is followed in Kadampulur in Tamil Nadu. 350 units are uh, actually existing in that particular location in a home-level processing. Unit weight benefit of cashew. Instead of selling raw cashew nut, if you process and sell it, you, you will be able to get, it's actually on 88 rupees. 88 rupees extra one can gain out of it. In three months, uh, I mean, processing, they may be able to get 80,000 rupees per month. This is about the feasibility of cashew processing system. This is what I mentioned. Instead of uh, selling the raw cashew nut, if it is uh, processed and sold in the market, an additional value of 88 rupees that can be gained out of cash processing. That is why even it is impo I mean, uh, promoted to the, I mean, the cultivator, especially farmers, to make them to become a producer, processor rather. And this is the cost economics, which will lead to a monthly product, I mean, uh, profit of 80,000 rupees. Well, we have agribusiness incubation center in our institute, a state of art facilities available to process the raw cashew nut. People who are not having knowledge on cashew, not having any experience and not having any money with them. But if they have interest with them, they can visit our institute and they can get it registered as an incubator. And the, uh, based on the custom hiring facility, one can undergo the hands-on training in our institute. And uh, once they can, use, I mean, register with the institute, they can... Uh, use the facility almost for six months. So another thing is actually as far as this agribusiness incubation center in our institute is concerned, any innovative technology, if you have in your mind, you can approach us, we'll be able to, I mean, come out of with the refined technology and go for commercialization. And of course, other things are related to starting up, a, I mean, a cash processing system and business, uh, I mean, uh, assistance for that one. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir. For the, no, thank you so much, sir, for such a knowledgeable session. Now we will proceed to the next technical session, which is on scope, nutritional importance, and different type of tea processing in India. For this session, we have with us Mr. S. Sandra Rajan, that he is a director of tea development, tea board of India, Kolkata. I would like to quickly to introduce her to you. He joined tea board India in 2013 as a director of tea development. He has worked in various managerial capacities in tea plantation across South India for 25 years and has contributed to the tea industries in various tea producer association as secretary or president. He has on hand experience in setting up a new tea factories and large tea plantation and supervising a large number of unionized workforce. He is the chairman of the working group of on, uh, organic tea in FAO IGG for tea, secretary of in, in national. T Research Foundation for the last five years. I welcome you, sir, and thank you for accepting our invitation. The session is over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the director Niftem and uh, all the organizers from Niftem. Uh, and uh, good afternoon to all the participants and all the uh, uh, people who have joined the webinar today. Uh, can I have my presentation? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> See, today, uh, the topic uh, which I'm going to cover, hope I'm audible now. Hello? Yes, sir, you're audible. Okay, thank you. If there is anything uh, wrong, I mean, just uh, inform me if there is, I'm not audible. Okay. Uh, so, the topic uh, I'm going to cover is uh, scope, nutritional importance, and different types of tea processing in India. See, tea is a plantation crop. Uh, which is uh, grown in uh, India for the last over 200 years. Uh, it is an introduced crop in India. So many of the participants here may or may not know uh, um, about the 100% uh, about what is tea, where it is grown and all. So uh, first what I will uh, do is I will just have an introductory thing of what is tea and all. Then uh, what is tea consumption in the world and world versus India. Then black tea, green tea, what is the difference between black tea? Because many people, uh, including scientists and common man will ask, uh, 
what is green tea, what is black tea, whether drinking black tea is good, whether drinking black tea and green tea is good. So I will be covering that topic as well. Then health benefits of tea. Uh, uh, really, actually, the topic given was nutritional aspects of tea. Uh, tea as such uh, is not a nutrition uh, as such. It is a health drink. Uh, it does not contribute like any, it does not have carbohydrate, protein or things like that. But it has got a lot of uh, uh, flavonoids and a uh, lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, epicalogatechin, ECGC and all uh, those good uh, uh, things. So uh, I'll be covering uh, the health benefits of tea. Then uh, briefly about tea drinking habits in India. Then there are myths and facts about uh, tea drinking uh, in India. And different type of tea processing I will cover at the last so my overall uh, presentation today will cover these aspects uh, for the benefit of the participants in this webinar. I'm so thankful for uh, NIFTAM again and, uh, and uh, good afternoon to all the participants who have joined uh, just now also. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. See, for those academicians, this is a uh, slide. Uh, which says that, you know, what is tea? Tea is made from tender leaves and buds of Camellia sinensis. There are three major varieties, Camellia sinensis, variety sinensis. This is the native of China and Camellia sinensis variety Assamica. It is native of uh, India. Uh, actually, tea genome project has been done in India. And uh, we have found out that, that uh, there is a gene uh, which is native of uh, Assam. So there are native varieties which have uh, been widely growing in India, uh, even much before it was officially introduced from other uh, uh, growing countries like China. So that is uh, uh, Camellia sinensis variety Assamica. Then Camellia sinensis subspecies uh, Lassicalix Cambod. This is commercially cultivated variety in India elsewhere. Uh, see, tea is the most popular beverage consumed by two-thirds of the world's population, uh, next only to the water. Uh, tea being manufactured from the plant Camellia sinensis consists four types of teas, basically. Basically, it is green tea, black tea, oolong tea, and white tea. So what is this tea, uh, green tea, oolong tea, and white tea? I'll be covering in the forthcoming slides. The polyphenolic compounds, catechins in green tea, it is in, cat, it is in the form of catechins in green tea and in the form of theoflavins in black tea, are strong antioxidants. Antioxidants, have, as all of you know, antioxidants are very important for uh, our health. Uh, a lot of things are uh, spoken about antioxidants even during the COVID period. Uh, the role of antioxidants in uh, uh, removing the free radicals, utilizing the free radicals uh, in the body. So I'm not going into the medicals of it, but it has got a lot of antioxidants. Next only to, you know, the highest amount of antioxidant content in any uh, uh, berry is uh, uh, gooseberry, as you all know. Indian gooseberry has got the highest uh, percentage or uh, unit, uh, units of uh, uh, antioxidants. It is around two 86 something it is the highest so tea comes very uh, i mean it's not even nearer to that uh, so just uh, give you an overview of you know what is the production international tea versus uh, indian uh, what is the production what is the area and all see we are uh, second in production share of production after china because china produces uh, highest quantity of tea but uh, most of it uh, highest production is on green tea uh, whereas on black tea, we can see that uh, India is the largest producer of black tea. And also India is the largest consumer of black tea also. Okay, it's around, uh, consumption is around 1,168 million. That is the largest in the world. So the world production in, of tea is around 6,423 million kilos, of which India share is 21%. And uh, we stand uh, on uh, second. On exports, the world is exporting around 1,381 million, 1,831 million. Uh, India's share is 227 million. Uh, that is, we uh, come of uh, China, uh, Kenya, China, and Sri Lanka. Uh, we are actually fourth uh, largest exporter. 
the percentage of total production, uh, 17 percent of our Indian production is being exported. We also import a, a small quantity of tea, around 30 million, which is about two or one percent of uh, our total production. Mainly, it comes from you know uh, FTA, free trade agreement countries like uh, Nepal and Indonesia, Bangladesh, like that. Uh, next, please. We also, I mean, I would like to in, introduce the, inform the audience that uh, what is the per capita consumption of tea in the uh, major tea uh, consuming countries. If you look at it, the uh, Turkey has got the highest uh, per capita consumption of around 3.25 kilos, uh, whereas India is uh, 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 somewhere in the middle uh, with nearly around 850, 856 grams per capita consumption. Uh, as you all know, tea is an introduced drink, drink in India. It was introduced by uh, British uh, uh, people uh, when they were uh, in India. So this is the overall uh, picture of how the tea is consumed uh, all over the world, uh, who consumes most per capita. Next, please. Yeah. Coming back to the Indian production, how much we produce, how much we export, and how much is the domestic retention over a period of the uh, last uh, 70 years? Just give an overview. We were a very uh, small, uh, see, tea was major in 1950, you see the figure. We were producing only for the export market. Our production was something around 278 million kilos and our exports was around 200 million. So domestic retention or consumption was nearly uh, 77 million kilos. From there, we have grown up to 1,365 million over a period of 72 years. And uh, our exports are more or less remaining the same around 200, 227, 242 million kilos. Maximum it went up to 242, uh, 268 also in some years. I mean, on an average, it's around 200 million kilo is our product, our uh, product export. Uh, whereas you see the domestic retention, uh, we started drinking more and more tea over the last 70 years. So from mere uh, 77 million kilos of tea, we have grown to 1,138 million kilos of internal consumption, that is domestic consumption. That shows, you know, how much uh, tea we have uh, started drinking, how it was introduced, and uh, how we, we adapted to that drink. It is a, you know, uh, it's a home drink now. Any guests come, you know, we offer tea. Even, you know, it has become a custom also. Uh, I mean, even when you, when a, a boy wants to go and see a girl in a family in Indian culture uh, before marriage, the first thing which is offered is tea. I mean, it has become part of our culture. Elsewhere in China and other countries where tea is uh, there for more than 500, 600 years, it is actually ingrained in their culture. We are also closer to that, but not as, uh, I mean, uh, ingrained as, that of China and other Japan. Next, please. Can I have the next, please? Yeah. Uh, this is the consumption pattern. You know, like uh, uh, South India, you see, we are consuming around uh, around 18% only. Uh, actually, North India consumes 32%. And it is not uh, only related to population. It is also related to the consumption pattern. Uh, generally, South India consumes more of coffee than tea, so the consumption uh, even with equal population, the consumption pattern is uh, percentage is lesser in uh, South India. That is only 18 percent, and uh, in Eastern uh, India also it is less. People uh, consume less uh, tea, and uh, in uh, North and uh, Western India it is uh, almost 30 32 percent. Next, please. Uh, since a lot of academicians are there, I thought I will just include a, a slide on what are the chemical composition of green tea and black tea, uh, scientifically. So major uh, polyphenolic acid compounds are common present in tea. See, there are five major catechins in tea, uh, catechin, epi catechin, epigallocatechin, 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 EGCG it is called. If you see both uh, compare green tea and black tea, uh, item by protein, amino acids, and all uh, fiber kind, kind of thing, it is almost similar. Only total catechin milligram per uh, gram is around 150 
to 200 in uh, green tea and it is in it is 40 to 60 in uh, black tea. Why it is? Because catechins are converted into TF and TR, that is flavonoids in black tea due to fermentation. So fermented black tea contains more of uh, TR, TF, that is TR flavins and uh, TR rubigins, that is around 160, 60 to 180 uh, milligram per uh, gram. So more or less, I mean, the chemical and uh, chemical composition of both the green tea and black tea are, 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 are the same uh, in terms of uh, chemical composition, whereas in the taste pattern, uh, it differs uh, in the uh, uh, mouth, I mean, uh, while drinking the tea, the black tea taste is different and the green tea taste is different. It is mostly to do with the, you know, preference of the uh, people who wants to drink uh, certain kinds of tea. Next, please. Uh, green tea or black tea, which is uh, healthier? Because there is, uh, as you all know, the youngsters uh, today, uh, the, most of them, uh, it has become a you know a little, of, a little bit of patient also that uh, drinking green tea is uh, better. So I'm drinking green tea. So I mean I don't say that it is bad, but uh, you know scientifically I, I can only say that both uh, green tea and uh, uh, black tea have got the same uh, uh, components. The only uh, thing is that uh, you know green and black tea both have notable health benefits and advantages. And the black tea taste is familiar, but the green tea has an acquired taste. From the scientific and health perspective, both are equally good, can't claim superiority over another. Uh, this is based on the scientific uh, data and uh, analysis done. Uh, both are rich in poly polyphenols and polyphenols are different types. That's all, there is a difference. Both type of polyphenols are equally active in physiological conditions. Both have similar antioxidant properties. Tea is actually, you know, drunk uh, and, uh, and popular for its antioxidant and uh, caffeine content. The caffeine content is slightly lesser in green tea, but uh, it is, uh, it is uh, that is how the taste is a little different in green tea. So, uh, I mean, uh, to put it simple, uh, that both green tea and black tea have got the similar health benefits. Uh, it is only a question of, you know, if somebody wants to, you know, go for green tea, we are not saying that he should not drink. Uh, what actually spoils the good qualities of uh, tea is that uh, adding sugar and the milk. Uh, milk uh, proteins also, to a certain extent, uh, polyphenol content of tea and the antioxidant properties of tea is uh, diluted. Uh, so, worldwide, the tea is drunk without milk and sugar. Worldwide, most of the tea drinking countries, uh, including the highest uh, uh, consumer like Turkey. In India, uh, when British introduced tea, so we were not accepting the tea as it is. So then they added milk and sugar and uh, it is called chai. Uh, elsewhere in the tea consuming countries like uh, uh, UK or where, chai means chai is uh, milk and uh, uh, sugar tea. So tea is normal, chai means it is milk and sugar, uh, they say cooked tea, it's milk and sugar cooked tea. Next please. Can I have the next please? Yes. So even uh, in, uh, you know, I just want to take you how tea was introduced uh, in uh, Britain in uh, 1657. Uh, so the oldest record available in the British uh, library says that uh, the first tea was introduced as uh, uh, as a health drink in original pamphlets in London Museum is available that uh, I have just enlarged it and uh, made it into a word file for your reference. So it was introduced as a health drink in, in Britain in 1657. Next please. So what are the health benefits? As I uh, told you in the introduction, introductory speech, that tea, you know, does not provide major nutrition what uh, the body requires, but it has got health benefits uh, like you know it, it has an in inhibition on uh, inflammation, prevents certain types of cancer, prevents certain types of heart disease, protein, uh, protect the uh, you know uh, brain old age, kills some bacteria and viruses prevents diabetes. These are all based on the clinical uh, studies done uh, world over. 
so that has been collated and there are medical evidences that uh, he is uh, you know having positive health conditions next please so the health benefits of tea i am again uh, putting it uh, in nutshell it uh, lowers cholesterol it prevents skin damage it helps with uh, good digestive health protects liver function relaxes the body that uh, everyone can feel whether liver function is done or not normal person cannot uh, feel but whether it relaxes the body uh, everyone who is drinking tea uh, will be able to find uh, and the changes here uh, what is happening in the body after drinking a cup of tea so the help it helps to prevent cancer and prevents arthritis tea tempers the spirits and harmonizes the mind dispels this is a uh, old new uh, you tea master uh, in uh, china he has uh, written this uh, next please i'll just take you through the next few slides i can even run it faster because uh, there are uh, evidences that it has a uh, effect on effects on tea uh, certain cancers so decrease the uh, risk of several types of cancers uh, there's no cure but there is a decrease then uh, also on cardiovascular diseases uh, who regularly consume three to four cups of black tea have reduced risk of heart disease and uh, 44 percent reduced risk tea and immune functions it l-theanine found in uh, tea uh, primes the immune systems tea flavin and black tea, in black tea even, even inhibits uh, hepatitis uh, c hiv uh, c virus hcv virus infection in early stages and due, I mean, it has got a uh, neurological T polyphenols, many LP and in provides overall neuroprotection. Next, please. So, it uh, also, you know, at, uh, if it is taken without, uh, I mean, sugar and uh, milk, which will add calories, if it is taken without sugar and milk, uh, there is a pos positive thing on uh, weight management also. Uh, it may, I'm telling it may uh, help in weight management. So it has got a elsewhere. I mean, in Japan and other uh, tea, uh, old and tea drinking countries, it is used for uh, skin uh, uh, cosmetics also. Super rich catechin, so it is uh, used. So tea drinking habits are uh, well known to uh, us. You know, tea is mostly consumed in black with tea, black tea without sugar and milk. I am again repeating it. In India, tea is consumed as chai, milk and sugar mostly. Substituting, you know, in most of the uh, in most of the uh, smaller uh, cities and smaller towns, uh, for breakfast uh, for a normal day-to-day uh, -day workers, you know, they will have one bun and uh, some good uh, tea. That is a breakfast, so it is a, almost a substitute for many millions of people. Tea is an ingredient in many food items, ice creams and all that. Can I go back to the previous please? Is it problem? Yeah. Uh, and tea is an ingredient in many food items like ice cream cakes and all. Most places consume it as afternoon tea. Uh, I just wanted to highlight this the high tea habit when you know the Britain, the workers went for work. Uh, in India, also, we have high tea nowadays. It's become a patient that uh, Britain it started with the workers who came back after a very tired some works in the factories. Uh, they had a tea with some snacks that was called high tea at 6 pm. So it is not a dinner, but it is uh, you know high uh, before six. The tea is best when it consumed with it without sugar and milk, uh, with, uh, which adds calories. Next, please. So uh, there are uh, uh, three types of uh, teas uh, made uh, within uh, the same uh, uh, green leaf. That is, uh, green leaf is the raw material, which is the uh, uh, plucked green leaf. So it is actually pan fried, rolled, and then dried. So green tea does not have fermentation. The tea without fermentation is called green tea. What is oolong tea? Oolong tea is withered. Withering also starts fermentation. Then it is bluish, then partially fermented, then pan fried, it is dried. It is called oolong tea. So oolong tea is a partially fermented tea. So what is black tea in India? Uh, I mean, 95% of our consumption is black tea. It is actually withered, and uh, there is a process called rolling. Then it is fully fermented. Then it is fired. Fire means it is drying, removal of moisture, and then it is dried. This is the uh, more or less uh, the overall 
can you click the next uh, yes one more yeah so this is what uh, you know green tea is non fermented oolong tea is uh, uh, semi fermented and black tea is fully fermented or oxidized that that is why it is becoming black it's because of oxidation next please yeah you click once more please click once more yeah once more let the letters come so so this is based on no uh, go back yeah please and uh, see there are uh, even in black tea there are two types of black tea uh, the one is orthodox if you see the picture on the right you know leafy picture and it gives a very light very light liquor uh, that is called uh, you know orthodox there is a machinery it's only in the you know way the, the green tea leaf is processed in the factory there are two types of machinery i have shown the machinery type also in this picture uh, the one in the top is called orthodox machine and it rolls it rolls and makes the leaves roller uh, kind of a leafy kind of long leaf kind of thing and actually second uh, type is called ctc ctc stands for crushing tearing and curling this is the dust tea and uh, which most of us drink as uh, strong uh, uh, tea with milk and sugar so this second type goes very well with milk so this type of tea is uh, mostly consumed in uh, india and uh, in it is produced uh, highly in kenya also in pakistan also people consume uh, with milk and sugar because our as our uh, neighboring country so ctc and uh, orthodox this is the basic difference right here you see the dust kind of uh, tea you know it is a powdery kind of tea that is called ctc leafy kind is called uh, orthodox next please So again, I have already explained what is the process. CTC, orthodox green tea, plucking, withering, crushing. So unfermented is green tea, and fermented is both orthodox and CTC. Orthodox there is rolling, and in CTC it is crushed, tear, and curl. That is the only difference. Crushed, tear, and curl. That is the way you treat the leaf, uh, like you are mashing the leaf. Uh, that is different in uh, CTC and different in orthodox. Next, please. Yeah, this is a you know how tea processing for uh, those who are not uh, uh, in real know how of tea, how tea is uh, coming from the plucking. Plucking means uh, from the time it is uh, being plucked from the tea garden, how it reaches the cup. So it is plucking, then it goes for weighing. Somebody weighs it. It is transported to the factory. Factory uh, it goes for withering. That, that is the first process. Then it goes for rolling. Then roll breaking, fermentation, drying, grading. Then bulk packaging. Then it goes to the uh, big packeteers like uh, tasting, auctioneering. Then it goes to the packeteers, big packeteers like they only buy it and they packet it into a smaller packets to consumer pack like big uh, packeteers do. There are a lot of regional packets also. Then in either packets or in loose tea also, it reaches the consumer at the end. Uh, by the time it reaches, there are so many stakeholders and process in in a simple tea what uh, we are. Drinking every day morning. Next, please. So there are uh, nowadays there is fifty percent of the tea grown in India. That is around six hundred, seven hundred million kilos of tea is being produced by the small tea growers. So small tea growers have a small factory. They also have uh, uh, smaller uh, machines uh, uh, available, and uh, they produce their own tea and uh, market it. And they also supply to some uh, existing leaf factories. Uh, which buy the leaf and process. So this is a new phenomena over uh, past uh, 20 to 30 years. The small tea grower has uh, grown. The number of uh, growers have grown to 50 percent. Uh, mainly, the expansion has happened in Assam and West Bengal. In Nilgiris, more than 50 years back, uh, the small tea growers were uh, planting tea, and uh, they are already established players. Next, please. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, we are running short of time. Can you monitor uh, the session? Oh, sorry, one more, one more, uh, two more slides. I'll complete. And uh, there are myths and things. I'm not going to explain it in detail. So uh, there are myths that whether you will become dark. No. Will you drink tea? Make your grass hair green. No. Children can't drink tea. No. It is absolutely fine for children to have tea because uh, many people don't give uh, tea to children. Next, please. Next, next, please. Yeah. So there are a lot of research projects which have been done in 
uh, under the guise of aegis of uh, National Tree Research Foundation total project. So there are more than 165 papers published for you know those who want to refer it, they can refer it in ntrofindia.org. Uh, I think we have come to the end of the presentation. Can you go to the last slide, please? Yeah. So uh, I mean, uh, thank you so much. Uh, sorry if I have taken uh, two, three minutes more. I thought I should explain uh, the non T people are uh, who are all available. So that's why I went in a little. Uh, actually, for explaining T, half an hour is very short. It's a very big uh, industry. So thank you so much. Uh, okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir.